You're gonna be just fine. I just talk. You know, I just talk. Listen to them. Children of the night. Sick transit, Gloria. Thrill me. Hello everyone, welcome to Kill the Cast. My name is Jerry and joining me as always is the ever quotable Jay. Wendy, darling, light of my life, I'm not gonna hurt ya. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I said, I'm not gonna hurt ya. I'm just gonna bash your brains in. Mm -hmm. Bash them right the fuck in. And the Silent Hill biker himself, Kenneth. Yep, I'm here. Let's do this. Yep, it has been like a month since all three of us have gotten together for an episode. Uh, so we are here, we are back. We tried to put out an episode between that, but it, it did not work. So it was, once again, uh, a cursed episode. Toxic Avenger, you are a cursed episode. So Life happens, you know. Yep. Um, but that's okay, we are back. So, uh, Kenneth, what you uh, what you been doing? Um... Let's see. My daughter is about to belt up in jujitsu. Oh, um, yeah, fuck with us and we'll send her after you. Yeah, right. She's turning in to be a little badass. Um, my cat that I've had for 18 years finally decided that she was done with all of our bullshit, so she passed on, which sucks. Yeah, this episode is dedicated to you, Mary Jane. We love you and we miss you. Yep, and then other than that... Uh, Go into the Renaissance Festival and, uh, you know, discovering why found footage movies just is not my forte overall. <laughs> uh, Jay, what have you been up to? So, uh, overall, I've been working on my health pretty hardcore, uh, getting my diabetes in check. Uh, when I first went to the doctor to start this little journey, I was somewhere in like the upper 300s. Uh, and now my blood sugar averages about 100 to 110. Which is a huge. Yeah, you're fucking killing it. I can't. I still win. haven't been able to get mine down that far. Well, I will give props to the medicine. Granted, I have cut out almost entirely all sugar and carbs from my diet to do this, but the medicine is also helping. Uh, but more recently, I've been going to a lot of concerts. Uh, me and my buddy are doing uh, four concerts over the course of ten days. So uh, last night we were at Hatebreed. Uh, the Tuesday before that, we were at Combi Christ, which is like an industrial band, kind of like Rammstein. Uh, this next Tuesday, we're going to Belfagor, which is a death metal band. And then the Saturday, or the Tuesday, wait, the Saturday after that, we're going to go see Skeleton Witch. So four concerts, ten days. Uh, I'm too old for this shit. All right. Skeleton, Skeleton Witch is one of those bands that I've never seen live that I would like to see live. Well, I'll let you know how they are. Please, please do. I had never even heard of them until my buddy's like, "We're going to see them." I'm like, "Cool, I'll start listening." I don't really go. To, I don't really go to shows that much anymore. I used to go to them all the time, but now I really don't unless it's somebody that like I absolutely want to see. Like, uh, there's a band coming uh, in September. Um, they're like a fucking you know Norse folk metal band mixed with metal that's coming to fucking uh, coming to Atlanta. I'm probably going to go to that, but other than that, I really don't go to shows that many shows anymore. I That's wish fair. I went to more, but most of the bands that I would go see a show for, they don't tour because they're not a band anymore. So I just kind of sit here all alone. Um, Aww. Yeah. But as for me, God, I haven't really been doing fucking anything. Um, my whole week has been The Shining. It has taken over my life. Um, I did get a new design done for uh, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space uh, with the help of my friend Mike the Russian. So I'm super excited. It looks great. That shirt should be coming this week. Um, and uh, fucking uh, that's that's it. I, I legit like my week has been all I do is Game of Thrones currently. So when Game of Thrones ends tonight, actually, uh, my the next week will be Game of Thrones as I go through talking to everybody about it. And then I'll probably find something else to obsess over. But my whole life is Game of Thrones right now. We so, can talk about it tomorrow. That's that's how that is. Yeah, I'm going to watch it as soon as we get done recording um, to see if my predictions came right, but we can't talk about that. So, uh, we tonight are covering two features, which is something we do not do very often on this uh, show, but uh, we're doing one called Butterfly Kisses, which is going to be like a mini review uh, from 2018, and then we're going to do Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. So, first... Butterfly Kisses. 
this hour and a half m- movie is a found footage movie. A filmmaker discovers a box of videotapes depicting two students' disturbing film project featuring a local horror legend, The Peeping Tom. As he sets out to prove the story is real and release it as a work of his own, he loses himself and the film crew following him into his project. So, uh, the director, uh, Eric Myers, uh, kind of hit me up on Twitter and was like, hey, you want to review my movie? And I was like, uh, sh- you know what, let me watch it. And it was found footage. I am very hit or miss on found footage, but here lately, I have been enjoying it more. I liked the newer Blair Witch that came out. I liked uh, Phoenix Forgotten. I liked um, uh, both the Hell House LLC movies. I Were those good? Yes. Oh, my God. Hell House LLC 1 and 2 are both fucking fantastic. Um, And I liked, like, found footage 3D. Um, so I'm kind of getting a little bit more into found footage. I like it a bit more. The problem with found footage movies to me is that it's a lot of nothing happening until like the last 10 to 15 minutes and then something finally fucking happens, but it's just not enough. There's not enough good buildup. I usually don't care enough about the characters. Um, and that's, that's kind of the issue I have. I really don't need to say anything. You just said everything. Uh, is that how you felt about this movie? We'll let you go for it. How did you... So that's how you felt about this movie? Yeah, for the most part, man. I mean, it was just like, you know, the 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 dude that's, you know, making the making the film, you know what I'm saying, where he finds the box of the tapes and shit. I did not feel bad for this dude at all. Actually, I really didn't feel anything for this dude other than irritation. I mean, he just got on my fucking nerves. All right, that was one. You know what I'm saying? Uh, two... I did not. I, I thought the 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 chick in the in the tapes that he found. I didn't think she could act for shit. So I really didn't. I really didn't care about them at all. I didn't really care about their story. Um, and you know, I thought I, I was kind of like, okay, the myth of uh, of this guy, um, the the Blink Man or whatever. Um, Which is okay. Hold on. The Blink Man is a way better fucking name than Peeping Tom. I will say this. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I hated the name Peeping Tom. Uh, when I think of Peeping Tom, I think of perversion. Uh, Blink Man that is was my way name better. In college. It, it was for the like the three days you were there until they kicked you out because you didn't belong there. <laughs> uh, but yeah. anyway, continue. But yeah, I mean, I thought the myth of that was kind of cool. I liked the the effect of when he shows up on on their tape. You know, where it's at the end of the tunnel and it just kind of fucking materializes from the bottom. I like that. I thought that looked really good. Um, other than that, I mean, the I didn't feel like I was on any kind of roller coaster whatsoever of what was going on. I mean, and, and a lot of times I feel that way with found footage movies. Like, you know, I, I, I agree with you. I like the newest of the Blair Witch. I, I really like that one. Um, but... I didn't get intrigued about what was going on until the last 10 minutes. Just like you said, you know, when the thing pops up and, you know, spoiler alert, when the thing pops up and there's fucking, you know, they talk about the tunnel in the blink man's eyes where he's looking at the other person as they were that. I thought that was really cool. I was like, okay, where are they going to go with this? And then there was really not a whole lot else. There was not really any more information. The only things that happens is, okay, the the this guy's wife and takes his kid leaves him he goes on this fucking deeper rabbit hole about this trying to catch the blink man 100 percent wanting this to be real so that way he can prove to his wife and kid that something's going on and the next thing you know the guy's dead and i'm just like okay whatever the the special effects for what the i, I stopped on each frame of the guy in the bathtub as y'all can see i sent y'all a picture yeah uh, I stopped on each frame of that just to see what was going on. And then you don't really get any more information. Mm. And, okay. and the only thing that was said is what, oh, we'll find out when that, when that, when that footage surfaces in another 10 years. Well, you know, yeah. fuck that. I'm not going to remember you, this movie. You saw, in 10 the, years. you saw the end credits, right? I, I don't even know if I paid attention to them. Okay. So there, there's something in the, the, it has an end credit scene. Okay. Well, what was it? Uh, it was the uh, girl from the videotapes in a mental asylum with her eyelids removed. I saw the scene where she removes her eyelids. No, no, there's a scene yeah, at the end of credits. Because I sent a message in the in the group saying, guys, make sure you watch the... Well, I guess that uh, was like two weeks. You actually didn't... You weren't going to end up showing up for that show. So I guess that doesn't really matter since you, you probably wouldn't have caught that. 
that I said that because you weren't coming for those shows. That show. Right. Um, originally. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I mean, so, yeah, I mean, I missed that. So, okay, so she was in the mental institution w- with her eyelids cut off. So, obviously, she didn't die. So, it could, could or could not be fucking real, whatever was going on. I don't know. But I don't know, man. I just didn't get into it. I, I just really wasn't in it. Okay. And I wish I had been. You know what I'm saying? Because I love indie movies. I love, I love, st- I love supporting indie movies. You know, and there's been a lot of really fucking good ones. And I'm not saying to a certain audience that this movie's not good to people that this appeals to. It just doesn't appeal to me. Okay, Jay, what about you? Uh, I don't have nearly as much to say as Kenneth did. <laughs> um, I enjoyed it. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't really have a problem with any of the acting. Uh, the only thing that really kind of uh, put me off was the tonal differences between the original found footage that the college students were making and the documentary footage of the guy who found the footage were way on different different levels, even though they were kind of about the same. Like, one felt like an actual horror movie found footage, and the other one felt like a drama about making a documentary. Uh, so the tonal shifts, uh, every time there's a good amount of tension, it kind of takes you out of it by jumping to the guy who had found the found footage. Okay. Um, but I felt the acting was fine. I did like the myth that they built up. I agree that the name was stupid. Um, Peeping Tom is is the name for a guy who stares in your windows. It's not. That's a silly name for a ghost. Blink Man makes much more sense. Um, and then as far as the legend is concerned, though, I do think it's crazy that you would have to stare for that that amount. I can't even remember the exact amount of time. Maybe 12 yeah. hours or an yeah. hour. Like, who... Like how who does that by accident that this guy has killed that many people? Yeah, like, no, who I, could actually like that? That's a very that's a very extreme physical feat to be able to accomplish. Yeah, to especially have this since guy. comparing that to like saying Bloody Mary, you know, right? Or Charlie you would think Charlie you would, or something. After an hour of staring down a tunnel, you would think you would get somewhat more of a reward than a death. <laughs> well, you'd start seeing shit anyway if you kept your eyes open for an well, hour. Yeah, no, I mean, saucy I think... Jack comes out and gives you a blowjob. You know, I mean, whatever, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I've stared, I think the longest I've ever stared without blinking is like seven minutes. And that was fucking goddamn excruciating about the fucking, about five minutes in. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Uh, Well, uh, besides that, I I enjoyed it. I enjoyed uh, definitely the the footage that was found part of it more. Um, I really liked at the end when it all kind of came together and like the producers... Uh, found the hotel room with him dead, found the footage, then kept, you know, and it just kind of started again. I really like that, that kind of culmination of everything coming together. Um, and you could see how the, the crazy was getting passed on to this next, to the uh, the producer videography or whatever, whatever title he had. Uh, but overall, I enjoyed it. I wasn't bored with it. Okay, well, all right, so I... Looks like I did enjoy, I enjoyed the movie a lot more than Kenneth, but uh, looks like I, th- I also probably enjoyed it more than Jay. Um, I found something in this movie. Um, now, before I get into that, I will get, I do have some criticisms. Like I said, peeping name, peeping Tom name is, a, is fucking awful. Um, I didn't really get, like that. Um, there's some convenient writing uh, in the movie, which of course, it, it's a fucking found footage movie. But like, the biggest thing for convenient writing for me is... Why didn't they check the school for her? Like, they found all the locations where she was filming. They found people that she talked to, but they didn't go talk to the teacher at the school. They didn't go to the school. Her information should have been at the fucking school. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's my biggest complaint, is, is that one gigantic glaring loophole. But I enjoyed the movie so much that I, I really... I guess I can let it go, but that is a big loophole. Um, the ending is... The ending can be weak depending on where your point of view is. Um, I really liked the ending. I liked what happened to Gavin. I liked Eric and them finding him. Um, and I like finding out that the girl was still alive. Um, but there's a part of me that's like... It felt like the story... It left me with wanting more that the story is unfinished... And I really, really want to know, you know, where's Gavin's footage at now? How, what is, what do Eric and his team do about all of this? Where are they going to go with it? 
I really want a sequel to this movie because I really, I was invested in these fucking characters. I really liked them. Um, and here's why. Uh, this movie is truly about the desperation of being a filmmaker or even being someone who's trying to prove a UFO or Bigfoot exist. It's easy for the world to shit on you for, you know, for your project. And it can be frustrating feeling like no one believes your stuff as amazing as you do. That no one believes in you. It's, it's easy that way for others that don't get their dreams or even attempt to try so they just shit on you. Or they shit on you for your beliefs because it doesn't line up with theirs. It's the artist and the paranormal investigator. And that's what this film really is to me. It really is that in the guise of a found footage movie. It's Gavin trying to prove that he's a good filmmaker and he's got this great idea and he can do it. And it's also about, it's almost has this hint of a paranormal investigator going so far out of their way to try to prove that it's, it's fucking real and no one believes in him. Everyone's like, dude, shut the fuck up with your conspiracy theories. Um, and I fuck, I just fucking felt that. And, and I think I get where you're coming from, but, but I didn't, I didn't feel that. Like I said, I mean, the dude. I, to me, he just the whole time. I mean, it was just like I did not feel sympathy for this guy. Like, it's don't like get me a, wrong. He was Gavin was annoying in a lot of places. I thought he was a fucking arrogant cock. Uh, I, mean, I think I'm it was. Just, so, it's him so invested. No, that's that's fine. I, like, I just see him as someone who he thinks he's got this fucking right. Like he, like he, he's got this golden fucking egg, and he's so fucking sure of it. And then when things start backfiring it at him and he starts kind of losing his fucking mind, I get that. Because there's times where we have episodes of this podcast where I'm just like, oh my god, that was like the greatest fucking thing ever. That's going to fucking blow up. That's going to fucking kill. And, you know, it does all right. It does good. But it's not going to, it's not putting me up there with like movie crypt numbers, you know? I I get what you're saying. I mean, I think the only time in the movie where I really was like, well, that was kind of shitty, is when he went in front of the paranormal, the, the the group of paranormal people and these people were fucking ragging on him the way that they were. Or or when he went to the radio station and they kind of set him up to fail. Yeah, that uh, was fucked up. With yeah, it was, the Blair see, Witch guy. Yeah, but see, I didn't really... I, it, that one, I really didn't... You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you're going to go on the radio, you got a 50-50 chance of getting fucked anyway. You know what I'm saying? That's the reason why I was just like the moment that I that that they said in the movie that he was gonna go on a radio station. I was just like, "Yep, you're fixing to get goddamn shit on." But I wasn't expecting that when he went into the paranormal place and the way that they treated him. And I'm just like, you know, I'm sitting there. I was sitting there thinking, I'm just like, y'all motherfuckers are exactly the way they said it in the movie. Y'all motherfuckers that goddamn think lens flares are ghosts. Yeah, you think dust particles are fucking orbs. Yeah. Yeah, dude. And I'm like, you know, uh, that one was like, okay, I can totally feel where guy's coming from. But yeah. the rest of it, I was like, nah. So, uh, the movie, and the movie did get to me a little bit. I took a shower, like, right after I watched this movie. And all I could think about is blinking and closing your eyes on purpose for periods uh, and time differences. Like, what constitutes a blink and what constitutes just closing your eyes and resting them or link or, or winking. Like what constitutes a blink? What constitutes the blink man's rules? When mm. you go to sleep, does that count as a blink? Just so, one though. No. Yeah, if it so, did, you probably just everybody that did this would die in their sleep. Yeah. Well, no, because he comes at, well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Do your eyes open a lot when you sleep? I don't know. But you got But you got uh, Isn't it like, isn't it when your eyes are closed, he gets closer, and then when you open them, he stops, kind of like red light? Yeah. So pretty, if your eyes yeah, are closed for a long period of time. But I he think has... he only moves like a frame up. He doesn't move, like, if your eyes are lo- closed for a long time, he gets to move further. He only gets to move one step closer per time that the eye is closed. Oh, okay. I think. Um, I don't really know. But, so I'm in the shower, and I'm thinking about all this, you know, uh, there's, there's suds going down my body, you know, I was just going to say, and your penis uh, is in your hand and then you open your eyes and uh, and then, yeah, and and then saucy Jack right there. Um, uh, so, but when I got out of the shower, I looked out of my door and from my bathroom door, you can see my bedroom, which is, you know, the door is usually open. 
and I've got a I've got a tall cylinder fan in there that's black, and right above the fan is my uh, cat perch for my cats because we've got two one in the living room and one in the bedroom because they're spoiled, and so it kind of looked like a hat that was on top of a long skinny body, and I fucking jumped. Very nice. Yeah, I I got got by Don't this you movie. Love it when shit like that happens. Yeah, I don't um, ever experience that anymore, and I wish I did. I do, man. When I watch movies, I get really into them. And found footage movies, and paranormal movies, and alien abduction movies get me the most. Slashers don't get me anymore. Monsters don't really get me anymore. But paranormal and abduction alien movies still get me. And found footage is get me because they have a sense of realism to them, kind of. Right. Um, that's, that's the so, thing that I find interesting about you, Jerry, is the fact that paranormal movies get to you. But considering that you know your your wavering belief system yeah. on uh, on ghosts and things like that, it's just, that's the reason why I find it interesting. It's very weird, but ghost movies get to so sometimes. I'll watch like a ghost hunting show, um, like Ghost Adventures or something, and mm-hmm. I'll get a little paranoid about fucking ghosts. Man, they they kind of raise the hair, and a uh, little uh, blink uh, man, saucy Jack got me. So um, what you're saying is, is that if I decided I wanted to drag you in some, drag you into some dilapidated building next to a cemetery out in the middle of nowhere, you might get a little. I might little... have an anxiety. I don't know. I may go out there and just and and nothing happens and it, it makes it to where paranormal movies don't affect me anymore. But Kenneth, you know how it is. We get really into movies. Like we yeah. try to put ourselves in the movie. That backfires for me sometimes because of my anxiety. Well, I mean, and I get it, man. I mean, it's just like, I, I can't say really say anything. It's just that I find it interesting. But my belief on, on the paranormal and ghosts like that is also very wavering. So it's just like from day to day, you know, we've had these conversations from day to day. It's always like, okay, do I believe in ghosts? Do I not believe in ghosts? Do I believe in the afterlife? Do I not? You know what I'm saying? Do I believe in some fucking, you know, huge a huge power that none of us can see that's constituting everything that we do in our lives or not you know uh that those are things that go through my head every single fucking day so it's just like i can get where you're coming from but i'm probably going to try to drag you out to one of these places i'll go um so there was another thing with this movie um that i wanted to talk about and this apparently happens with a lot of uh independent horror movies now if you got now, we don't really rate movies, but if you had to give an IMDb rating, one to ten, what would you rate this movie, Kenneth? What would you give this movie, honestly, one to ten? You know, the bad thing about that is, and before <laughs> I give my rating, but I'm going to go ahead. And I, the bad thing about that is, is I, it's difficult for me to give a rating that I would want to give to the masses, and the reason being is because some people are really into this sort of thing, and some people aren't. You know, uh, I've got. But if you were to know me or listen to the podcast or anything, I've got a long history of back and forth with found footage movies. Some of them I really enjoy. Some of them I absolutely can't stand. You know, The Last Exorcism. That happens to be a fucking found footage movie that I think is a fucking atrocious, horrible fucking movie. People love it. The Blair Witch Project. I used to hate it. Now I'm kind of on the fence. You know, it just depends. In my personal opinion, at this current moment, I'd give it probably maybe a four or five. But the unfortunate thing about that is, is that might turn people off thinking that, you know, okay, this guy's going to, if this guy's giving it this kind of rating or blah, 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 it must kind of suck. No, that's just based on my personal opinion. Because it's, it's not, it, you know, the acting is kind of so-so. You know what I'm saying? It's shot fairly well for a found footage movie. There are some out there that are a lot worse. The I think the best acting in the movie is done by the producers and shit at the end. Those guys actually look like they're really dealing with some shit. You know? So, I mean, technically, it's not a bad movie. But from my personal opinion, I just don't really care for it and probably won't watch it again. So I'll throw it in the middle and I'll give it a five. Okay, not bad, Jay. What would you give it? i give it a seven. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Jay. i give it a seven. Um... When it comes to found footage, uh, I I re, I I like Hell House LLC better, but I think it's better than like Phoenix Forgotten. Um, 
I probably put it right there with uh, the newer Blair Witch. Um, so when you go and look at the reviews for this movie on IMDb, uh, there are now. I'll say this: I don't know what happened, but uh, I feel like there were more last time I looked at this. But there were more IMDb ratings calling out this movie for having fake IMDb ratings. Um, now, because it has primarily good ratings. I mean, uh, out of the 20 reviews that are on here, like full written out reviews, uh, the first, like, 9 out of the 20 are a 9 or a 10. Almost half. Um, in fact, there's only a couple that are, that 1, 2, 3... Four. There are four out of 20 reviews that are a five and under on this movie. And so there's a lot of people calling this movie for fake IMDb ratings. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if, you know, as a movie maker, do you, you know, you want your movie rated good. You know, do you have people go and give it ratings or, or not? And I'd be kind of interested to look at other independent movies and see uh, how often this happens. But I thought it was interesting when I was researching the movie that I saw reviews out there specifically saying that this movie had fake ratings. Um, now, uh, I think a, a, a 7 is a good rating for them. I don't think this movie should be a 9 or a 10. Even if you love found footage movies, I don't think you're giving this a 9 out of 10. Because at 9 out of 10, you're talking about legendary found footage at that point. Right. You're like, you're, That's got you, Cannibal Holocaust. Uh, yeah, that's Blair Witch. Like, and I'm talking about the original Blair Witch because in the found footage community, that's held very high. That's their 10 out of 10. Uh, you know, that's their Halloween for slashers or The Exorcist for demon movies or Jaws for, you know, uh, creature features. That's their fucking movie. Um, so I just thought it was very interesting. Do y'all think that uh, maybe with independent movies or we've seen it with a lot uh, of big movies, these fake ratings where people are bombing movies because they don't like that a female got lead casting or something. Like, is this an epidemic that that is something we should look at that's even happening in independent movies just in the opposite way where people are fake giving extremely positive reviews? I think it's an unfortunate thing. I think it's an extremely unfortunate thing, regardless of whether it's positive or negative, that people are literally taking the time because they don't have really shit else to do in their lives to go out and not be honest because of whatever stupid reason that they have for not liking a movie to try to destroy its credibility. You know, I mean, it's art. That's the thing about it. We can all have our opinions about it. But, you know, for for people to go on 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 a rampage because of whatever stupid reason that they didn't like the movie to try to sit there and get all their friends to boycott it over some stupid shit or whatever is ridiculous to me. It yeah. really is. And how do you feel about it being the opposite way? Say I mean, uh, either direction. I think it, I think it's ridiculous because you can't get an accurate like if I go into a movie and I'm looking at reviews online and all of them are positive and I get myself all hyped up because everybody fucking thinks this movie is the greatest thing in the world for whatever reason that they do. And then I turn around and I watch the movie and it's fucking garbage. If I did that before I went into a movie theater, I'd be fucking pissed, especially, you know, with the amount of money that you spend in a movie theater. You yeah, know well, what I'm saying? And I'll take movies. Look at this at a smaller scale, though. Even like, with independence, I still take movies very seriously. So it's just like, you know, the only thing that you're really doing good for the community in that sense is getting the views for an independent movie for whatever reason. So even for the positive, but I still think it I, either way, I think for there not to be any kind of honesty. What's that? What's that saying about people that are going out there and and. You know, I would much rather, you know how I am about honesty. I would much rather somebody get on there and tell me that a movie fucking sucks or it's goddamn great with their honest opinion than to tell me it's great and it sucks. And I wasted two hours of my life that I'll never get back. <laughs> All right. Jay, do you have any opinions on this? Uh, I don't think it should be done in either direction. Um, I think people should just, like Kenneth said, be honest. Give your honest opinion after you see the movie um, so that people who are using those ratings to decide whether or not they should go see a movie, which on a side note, I think is stupid anyway. Um, but 
Yeah, it shouldn't happen in either direction. Yeah, I'm. So, uh, it shouldn't. I, too, I agree. It should not happen in either direction. I can understand wanting to support an independent movie, especially one created by a friend. You know, you know, and and at that point, yeah, your bias is going to show a little bit, and you're going to say it's good. But for you to give it a ten, uh, you're just. All you're going to do is create a backlash for them, which we see with this movie, where people are going, oh, look at these fake reviews. Now, I don't know that these reviews are fake. Obviously, I have no, I don't know who fucking wrote these reviews. I don't know if they are fake. It could be someone who absolutely is just in love with found footage movie and they give it a 10. Uh, it could be like Don from Horror Mafia who gives a 10 out of sh- to Sharknado movies. I don't know um, what they're fucking doing here. But uh, if you are doing fake reviews, negative or, po- or positive, fucking stop. Look at it realistically. Rate it properly. Or don't rate it at all. Do like, We don't rate movies. Uh, we, you know, I, we rated this one to prove a point. But for us, it's either watch it or don't watch it. Or watch it with a, you know, here's the asterisk to it. Yeah, so. generally my ratings go from... When it, I mean, because we tried the rating thing before. Generally, what my ratings are, and both of you guys know this, the movie fucking sucks, or the movie's worth watching. Yeah, so, uh, and sometimes you just have an asterisk. If you're into found footage, I highly recommend Butterfly Kisses. I think you will enjoy the shit out of it. If you're kind of hit and miss with Butterfly Kisses, it's only an hour and a half. You may not like it, but if you've got Amazon Prime... Check it out. You may end up enjoying the story. I think if you are a creator in the sense that you do, you create short films or independent films, or you're a fucking paranormal investigator, I think you'll like this movie because I think there's this deep hidden meaning in there about, you know, trying to reach your dreams or trying to prove something to the world and it being shit on by all these other people. Like, I think there's a personal connection there um, that the world shits on me a lot. (laughs) Mostly health wise, but still. I actually watched one of those ghost hunting movies after this. After I got done watching it. Oh, what'd you watch? Oh, uh, it was something that was on fucking Amazon. It was one of the I don't even remember what it's called. Oh. That but, good, huh? Yeah. I, I mean it was it was one of those where the guys, you know, they set up the, the fucking night cameras and stuff like that and they pretty much, you know, Ooh, wait was for it Grave shit to Encounters? Happen. Grave Encounters was pretty decent. No, it wasn't like that. I mean, this was legit. Well, quote, oh, so it was legit. like an episode of Ghost Hunters. Yeah, but like, oh, okay. like an hour and a half long. It was very nice when I was going yeah. to bed because it was it kind of lulled me to sleep. Yeah, because they're fucking I, boring as shit. Well, you know what? I kind of like a lot of the show. I was watching a uh, a show that my some people might remember in the mid two thousands that was on Sci Fi Channel, uh, Fact or Faked Paranormal Files. I've mm-hmm. been watching episodes of that on uh, YouTube, and I like watching like Expedition Unknown with Josh Gates. Um, I'm super into alien documentaries. I like Bigfoot stuff. I watch, I watch, like, I watch, like, Monster Quest on the History Channel and shit. I'm super into that stuff. And when it comes to the ghost shows, some I like, some I don't like. I don't like Ghost Hunters, but... Is I that like, the first big one? Yeah, ghost, ghost Hunters, Hunters was the first big one. And I just never really cared for it. I thought it was boring. Now, say what you want about Ghost Adventures. At least it's fucking entertaining. <laughs> Which... If you Is that don't the one like... where they bring a psychic, quote unquote, with them? No, no. Oh, okay. Sometimes they will bring in a psychic, but they don't have one there always. Oh, uh, okay. Um, That's turned into psychics have turned into an interesting conversation between me and Jerry. We should record that sometime. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, but yeah, okay. We'll get back on track because we're about to jump into this huge topic. But yeah, butterfly kisses. I'm saying go give it a watch. Jay, what are you saying? I agree. Give it a watch, and then I'll ask a little add on that. Uh, if you're you're looking for decent found footage, and these would be suggestions to both of you too, uh, the Taking of Deborah Logan and Home Movie are two that I really really enjoyed. The Taking of Deborah Logan. Now that one, I really enjoyed that one. I that have not watched it, so one. I will have to watch that one. Uh, Kenneth, what are you saying? Watch it? Don't watch it? Oh, wait, the Taking of Deborah Logan? No, no, no. Butterfly Kisses. Uh, butterfly Kisses. <laughs> butterfly Kisses. I mean, again, like I said before. If you're into found footage, sure, give it a watch. I mean, it was decent. You know, if you're one of those people that just kind of like, eh, on found footage like I am, it's kind of a hit or a miss. It's not one of them things that I would go out of my way to watch. But if you're a found footage fan like Dave Z, go for it. Okay. Well, there we go. All right. 
So next up, we are talking about Stanley Kubrick's The Shining from 1980. Uh, it is two hours and 26 minutes long. Oh, yeah, it is. Uh, starring Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall and Danny Lloyd. Directed by Stanley Kubrick uh, and uh, written by Kubrick and many other people based off Stephen King's novel, The Shining. Um, okay. I am not even 100% sure where to fucking start with this movie. So Monday. I Boom. would <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I would like to first us all go through and talk about our experiences we've had with this movie. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. I have historically not liked this movie. I think it's boring. Um I don't get caught up in any of the atmosphere in it um i just i do i don't really care about the characters um i feel like there's a lot of i, fe I felt like there was a lot of overacting into it and and things like, i didn't really like the movie i understand the movie i thought technically it's a good movie i don't think it's a, like I, even when i don't like the movie i don't think it's a bad movie it's still a fucking great movie i just don't enjoy it it's not my slice of cake um so, and that's how i've been historically jay how how were you about this movie? Now, we are talking about before the current watch for this podcast. So don't so, include those thoughts. Before this current watch, I think I maybe watched it twice. Once as a, as a youngin. <laughs> uh, it was just something that was on when I used to not have, you know, when you had like 10 channels to pick from. And it was 3 in the morning because it's the weekend. You're staying up when you're not supposed to. So there's once I watched it then. And then once I watched it as an adult. Uh, it never really left an impact on me, so I never really cared to watch it again. I just, outside of this rewatch, I didn't really have any memories outside of the Here's Johnny that everyone knows because it became super popular. Um, so I didn't really have any attachment to this movie one way or another. I just remember it not being exciting enough for me to want to watch it on purpose. <laughs> yeah. All right, Kenneth. Um, I've been watching this movie on, on and off since I was a kid. It was one of the favorites for my mom. And so I, I couldn't even tell you how old I was the first time I watched this movie. Like, well, the first time I knew of it, um, the first time I actually, you know, consciously sat down and watched it, I was probably like seven. And so I have very fond memories of a kid of, you know, Jack Nicholson fucking goddamn, you know, going at a door with an axe and then sticking his face in it and going, here's Johnny. I have very fond memories of that. So as a kid, I enjoyed it. And then as I got older and started looking at it from the artistic eye, I fucking loved it. I think it looks great. I think it's a phenomenal movie. Um, my, my viewpoint changed on it a little bit the first time that I read or listened to the book. I can't remember which one I did. And uh, my viewpoint on it changed a little bit because it was removed from the source material. But I always enjoyed it. And to this day, I've, I've always enjoyed it. You know, it's just learning all the myths and everything behind it or, or truths, however you want to look at it. That's what makes it even more interesting. Um, I agree with you there. Okay. Now we are going to go into uh, this. This is going to be a weird review because it's going to be broken down into a couple of different pieces because you kind of have to with this movie. Um, we are now going to go into how we felt after this current watch. Um, I don't know how many times y'all watched this movie this week. I've watched it four times on top of, uh, hours upon hours of research and watching room two, 237 and, uh, two or three different making of documentaries on the movie. Um, it consumed my fucking week as I dug deeper into it. Now, <laughs> I, um, I still think the movie is boring. It gets better for me at the end, but I still find the movie is boring. I still feel like the movie is the, the movie itself feels like an exaggeration. The acting feels like an exaggeration. The score feels like an exaggeration. The length of the goddamn movie feels like an exaggeration. Um, a great example to me of this is is um, Wendy discovering the body of the black dude who I can't remember his name right now because um, my mind is kind of mush at this point. Is it, the great it, example? Holleran? Yeah, Holleran. Uh No, Kenneth. I'm, every time I talk his about a black is, dude, I'm not it, talking about penis. 
His told name you this. Is Dick Halloran. Oh, okay. Uh, is it? But this scene is a great example of, of exaggeration because the score is so goddamn loud, and the camera zooms into the body. It's very cliche, and it's very just screaming "Look!" instead of being subtle. Um, and I just really can't stand that fucking scene. Um, now, Kenneth, you had a defense of this scene, if I remember correctly. You talking about the one where Dick's on the floor? Yeah, there's D- Wendy sees the dick on the floor. There's loud <laughs> music and the camera zooms in on the. Wendy dick. sees the BBC on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, honestly, at the I, th- I've always thought that that particular scene, it's in its intent, is one hundred percent to be unnerving. It's supposed to be. It's supposed to the music combined with the way it is. I mean, with it being in your face, it's not supposed to be subtle. They want it to be in your face. They want it to just be like, blam! You know what I mean? Check this out. And and and, and I think the music does it with it very well. Um, I actually enjoyed that, especially when there are so many other subtleties in the movie. There, I think that's what fucks it up, though. There's Most of the movie is so subtle. I mean, um, yeah. It, but that's and it's what I'm crazy. Saying. It's so smooth and everything that goes through, even though that the music is unnerving throughout the whole movie. But everything is so subtle and whatnot. And as the progression goes of all the fucked up shit that's happening in the last, you know, few minutes of it between, you know, uh, Jack going after him and him, you know, it's almost like right after he comes out of being locked in the uh, in the pantry. It's just like, bam, 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 bam. And I think that's I think that's the point where it's just like, you know, you're just kind of strolling along. You see him get that. You see him get axed. And the next thing you see is you see this powerful shot of Wendy seeing it. It's almost like you're inside of her. You know what I'm saying? Which I don't, I, I'm not a big fan of Shelley Duvall, so I wouldn't want to be inside of her. But it's it, it's almost like you are inside of her. I mean, what would it be like? You know, what would it be like for you if you come call, come around the corner and you saw something like that? That's what it would be like. Everything. I mean, you walked around the corner and you're not used to seeing dead bodies all the time. And you walk around the corner and then you just see this dude that could or could not have been your salvation with a fucking goddamn, you know, hole in his chest. And you see it and you're like shocked and in awe and all this other kind of stuff that's going on. And and, and, and the music is almost like the flashes in your head. You know, like when you see something that 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 that's just as fucked up and is like that, you know, when you're in real life and you got all these fucking synapses and everything going on in your brain. And it's just like, pow, 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 pow. That's the way that music does to you when you see something like that. That. It's just like, boom! And you're like, holy fuck, what the fuck is going on? There's a dead man right there. My husband's going to kill me. My husband's going to kill my child. I got to figure this shit out. I got to figure out what the fuck's going on. I got to get him out of here. I got to get the fuck out of here. We're in this fucking isolation and we can't get out. What the fuck? That's yeah, what I, all, that, all that is going on in that second. You're not wrong, even though I still think that it's, it's fucking super over-exaggerated because... To me, when I if I walk upon a dead body, I don't have a zoom in effect. Uh, that camera zoom in effect is fucking awful. I have more of a taken back, like oh shit, what the fuck, backing up kind of thing. Not a zoom in effect. Um, and, and the music, I just can't get with the the music. Just is too jarring for me. It jars me right out of the scene. So instead of like feeling. And I know, and you've told me what the, because we talked about the music in this movie, mm-hmm. um, and, and I'm sure you'll get into that when you get to your review, your current review, but um, I have great respect for this movie. I think it is a fantastic movie. Um, it's just not enjoyable for me to watch. At the end of the day, I sit down and I go, what the fuck is in Room 237? And my answer is, fucking nothing the movie has a lot of unanswered shit but also has so much detail in the background that i'm not surprised why this movie has become what it is it's a mystery of the artist with so many leading shots that take you on trips uh throughout the entire set of the hotel it's basically a look and find you you sit there and it leads you to create theories to put into place of that hole that you have for not understanding what the what the director is trying to tell you. It's subliminally asking you to create your own theories. It's combining the myth of the author 
uh, of Kubrick because as everyone knows, Kubrick was this crazy attention to detail guy and he would put all this secret subtle shit in there. So it's taken that myth and being so keen to detail with his retakes and scrutinizing, scrutinizing every aspect of the set that it creates this perfect storm of a movie that it makes the movie bigger than what it is. Um, and, and I think that's why this movie isn't true. I don't think I've ever researched a movie and had so much... I've never seen so much shit about a movie. Ever. I don't think I even scraped the fucking surface. I was talking about... I called Dave Z to talk about him, and I brought up something that he, a super fan of this movie, didn't fucking know about. That's how fucking deep this movie gets with how much shit and info is out there on it. It's fucking ridiculous um so that's kind of where i'm at with the movie i think it's amazing it's just not my cup of tea i'm i'm gonna let jay go before we let kenneth go because i think kenneth is gonna have a mouthful like i do because uh, there's <laughs> You're a dick on the ground uh so uh does it unless someone has something to say to what i just said no i mean i'll i'll, I'll touch on some things as i go through my my stuff okay Kenneth, do you have anything to say on top of what I just said? Damn it. <laughs> I had something that I was going to come in with. I agree that in this movie there's a lot of things. That, that, that That's one of my biggest irritations is that there's so much stuff that is not explained for people that are not going to sit there and analyze the shit out of it like we are. Yeah, Dude, we don't even analyze this movie deep enough. Right. Because uh, uh, there's so many people out there that have done it. Because I've got and, theories. We will uh, do a whole fucking section on theories. Yeah, I'm going to let you go with that in a minute. But but it's just like, you know, for the for the casual viewer out there. And see, that's the reason why I don't think it did as well in the box office as it could have. Is I think that's part of it. Is that people knew that it was a visually stunning movie. But also at the same time, I think there was a lot of stuff that they're just like, it di- didn't quite get. And then you got super fans of the book that and there's so much shit that is different that you know because stanley kubrick just basically used the book as an outline and made his own shit yeah which you'll get into yeah Uh, that's your specialty part on this right and so i think i think that was one of the biggest hindering factors but i still i still enjoy the movie so yeah we'll just go forward (laughs) i i do want to point out my favorite scene before i give it to jay um, the scene of Wendy walking and finding Jack's writing, and it's the same line over and over, done in different styles. Um, there, there, it doesn't have Jack just pop over her shoulder and shock you. It has this leading shot that you can obviously tell is Jack coming towards her, and then the the conversation as they continue to follow, and she is backed up the stairs. And the conversation they're having, uh, and, and you know, then him getting hit in the head and falling down the stairs. This whole scene is absolutely amazing in every sense of the word, um, from the dialogue that's being said to the absolutely insanity of Jack Nicholson and his portrayal of this scene. I just turned around. And literally, right now, Jack is walking up the stairs. It's fucking A. Yeah, that's I mean, my like, favorite literally. scene in this movie. That that fucking, this, what he's saying in that scene is so fucking good. And her reaction to seeing what he's fucking been writing is so fucking good. I just love it. So that's my favorite scene. Um, Jay, let's get into what you thought about The Shining upon this rewatch. Okay, so... Uh, I only had a chance to watch it once because my life is fucking ridiculously hectic right now. And it's, uh, yeah. So I watched it once. Um, I tried to go into it with as much of an open mind as possible uh, because, as I had said upon previous viewings, I was just kind of like, eh, whatever. Um, so this this movie is... Like, the status I made on my personal Facebook as I finished the movie um, was basically, this is one of the most beautifully shot and made movies ever that is boring as hell. Um, there are there are bits and pieces that I really like. Um, I like 
most of the character development, there's just a lot of stuff that kind of drags out the movie that is completely unnecessary. Um, you can kind of tell that Jack, before anything really happens, even in his opening scene where he's interviewing, uh, that he's just kind of a guy who's annoyed with everything going on in his life. Like you just, I just get that emotion from him immediately from the first time we see him on screen. And it just kind of progresses um, even before the family starts getting haunted by everything. He's just kind of an asshole and doesn't really like his family very much. Jack's always been haunted. Well, whatever. <laughs> um, so I thought the acting was great. Um, I liked the character development. Uh, my favorite thing about this movie is actually the camera work. Um, I didn't get to do as much research as both of you, uh, but I did do a little bit. And uh, it looks like the steady cam was kind of a new thing on, uh, you know, in Hollywood at the time. And Kubrick uses it beautifully here. One of my favorite things in film, doesn't matter the genre, is the uncut shot. A nice, real long take. We don't get a lot of that, especially in action, in action sequences in horror movies or action movies. Um, where, you know, fight scenes and stuff like that are always Shout out lots to old of, boy. Uh, lots of uh -huh. quick edits where uh, Eastern Eastern films have always used long shots with their, their martial arts choreography and whatnot to show almost entire fights without a single edit. So something this old to use that trick, and it's just, it's beautiful. Even just following Danny around on his tricycle as he loops that, that, that loop the, in the hallway or wherever it is 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 beautiful it's a beautiful shot it's just a boring film to me i think if they'd cut it down a little bit more uh if they had chosen maybe one or two of the the kind of branching storylines about the hotel to focus on like they introduced the psychic abilities and that comes into play once or twice in the movie they introduce all the different ghosts and you know the room with the the crazy lady in it and you know, it's just kind of a whole bunch of branching things that I've never actually read the book, but I'm assuming have little bits of the book in them, but none of it really goes anywhere besides Jack going crazy. So I feel like if they had just picked one or two of the things to focus on, it could have been a much better movie and you could have shortened it down a little bit. Um, I read that a lot of people who are super fans of this movie like to dive into things like continuity errors and what what Kubrick means and personally looking at them and and looking at what people say I feel like a lot of this stuff is just people trying to excuse lazy filmmaking um no it's not that no there is no such thing as lazy filmmaking when it comes to Kubrick well, I will I will stand here and say completely wrong are mistakes made in this movie 100 percent but what the, what I disagree with is not uh, them making an excuse for lazy filmmaking. They think that Kubrick makes absolutely no mistakes so that every mistake must fucking mean something. Right, and I completely did. But it's not lazy filmmaking. But he made people do actually just mistakes. Yes, and they has are. no meaning. But I, that, I, that's... Yeah, but I just don't want you. I just I think you should change how you say that because I don't think anyone would ever call Kubrick a lazy filmmaker. So no. I don't think I'm not saying overall he's lazy, but to not have a like there's actually a position on set of somebody who's supposed to be in charge of continuity where, you know, like things are staged when you cut and go to the next scene. So if there's if there's not somebody doing that, then, you know, I, I just feel like they might be. Maybe lazy isn't the right. I, there, one. there's always like mistakes in movies. There's always goofs yes, in movies, I, and that. But I just don't think it's lazy filmmaking. I think it just it, it, you're allowed to have some. That's fair. I yeah. just don't like your choice of words of saying they're defending lazy filmmaking when I think they're doing something much fucking worse. Where they claim that Kubrick can do no fucking wrong and everything. One of the theories I was looking at, uh, I won't go into the theory, but it was talking about. The scene where Wendy walks in on Jack when he's at his typewriter for the first time, uh, there's a shot looking at Jack, and there's a chair behind him. The shot then goes to Wendy, then cuts back to Jack, and the chair is gone. And they're like, it has to mean something. What's right, so that's exactly what I'm talking about, is all of those. Like, um, another one I read was the uh, 
the disappearing cigarette in the interview scene. That it's uh, there, there's it's gone, that, it's there. The um, typewriter changes colors. Uh, there's a shadow of the helicopter in the beginning. There's all kind of tiny little things, and but right. some of them people claim it fucking means they're in that uh scene where jack is having his interview there's a guy who claims that it means something that when the guy comes up from around the desk and shakes hands with jack there's a uh, there's something on the desk that lines up perfectly to where his dick is and it shows that them shaking hands uh well, this kind of goes into something I'm talking about later. But there's a shot there that that means that that's his fucking penis. Well, yes. And, and that's, it's just... That's what I'm talking about. Maybe lazy is the wrong word. I don't really have... It is. It's people trying to... A different word for... Say that for, Cooper can do no wrong. The yeah. dick, The dick one and stuff like that, I, I, I completely disagree with. I think that... Um, I, I think that shit is just way too fucking deep. The chair one, on the other hand, I actually do think that was on purpose. So I'm not saying that there could be a better I, purpose. I just don't feel like every single continuity error in this movie is a massively hidden metaphor. Like, so you've got, you've got, and I feel like actually by doing that, they're taking away from the actual hidden stuff, like the hedge maze being in his tie in the interview. That's genius. That's great filmmaking. Attributing a missing stage prop to some sort of deep metaphor kind of takes away from what I didn't is say, I didn't there. say that I think the chair had a deep metaphor to it. I'm I just, just said no, that I'm I think, I just, I, oh, sorry. I said that I think that there was a purpose. I just don't, I don't think it was fucking this crazy deep fucking, some of the, Jerry will get into it. Some of it is so thick that I'm like, there's a point where I'm just like, okay, Y'all, y'all are surpassing having a life if you can think up some yeah. of this shit. But that's what they say is that the chair's missing, that there's a meaning to that. It's not an error. There's a meaning to it. And I just oh, disagree. I don't, think it's a, I don't think it's a deep meaning. I think you want me to go ahead and tell you what I think about the chair? Yeah. I think the purpose of the chair being moved is that the reason that it's supposed to symbolize like crazy shit happening, like a ghost moved it. That's what I think. I don't think that it's. I don't think it's has this deep, ominous, fucking crazy shit, you know, like the Indian heads or anything. So you're saying that because that's Wendy's point of view, that's her looking at Jack. The chair disappearing is ghost, which in this movie kind of represent Jack going crazy. It's her seeing that crazy is there and not accepting that it's actually happening yet. It, all the signs are there. She's just not seeing it until it's too late. I guess to it, I, I guess to a degree if you want to go into it a little bit thicker, but I, I honestly I think it's just one of those things that just kind of happens. A ghost moved a chair. Hmm. As simple okay. as that. Maybe I don't know. Well, these ghosts aren't those kind of ghosts, though. Well, we don't know that, Jay, because they don't fucking tell us. Actually, <laughs> I guess that's right. true. But so, all right. Well, well to end my to, let me let me just finish my thoughts really quick. To end my what what I was saying. Um, I just don't feel like a movie should need this amount of research for everything presented in it to make sense. Now, I can relate this to a movie like Hereditary or Mother, where everything, well, mostly everything in the movie has a metaphorical meaning, and you may have to research it to understand that meaning. But the evidence for those movies and why the things are happening is all contained within the movie. If you can figure it out, great. The movie is fine. The movie gives you what you need. If you have to go and research and guess, then the movie failed somewhere. And I think that's where a lot of the boringness mm. for me comes from, is that they just don't give you enough information. You have to fill in your own gaps. And that can be good when you get to it like an ambiguous ending, kind of like an inception where you don't know what's going on. But for the entire film to be filmed with that, to fi I, filled with that, is where it falls apart for me. I, I'm going to disagree with your else. phrasing real quick. I don't think the movie fails if you have to go research and put something together. Um, I think it fails if you have to, like, complete, like, if there's not, like, if you're, whatever you're basing it off of is not in the movie. If you're, like, because most of the stuff that people create theories, it's all in the fucking movie. Right, but Almost they're not. fucking it's, all of it. There's it's nothing just else not, in the movie to back up those theories. That oh, no, there is. 
Oh, no, you're, there is. There is tons of shit to back up all these crazy theories people have. That's the problem. There's too much shit. Uh, this movie, like, I think what you're trying to say is that if the, the movie doesn't, this movie doesn't directly give it to you. Uh, so you kind of have to do research to kind of look into all the shit that it could possibly be. But because it doesn't give you a, there's no one answer. So let me let me use an example, and then you can kind of tell me uh, what you think. We'll go with the chair that you guys are talking about. Kenneth's theory, a ghost move it. My theory, continuity error. Your theory, whatever research you came up with that people say. The movie doesn't tell you what happened. Correct, but a lot of things happen in multiple movies that doesn't tell you what happens. Butterfly Kisses doesn't tell you what happens at the end of the movie. Unfortunately. Yes, it does. You have... You ha- there's a lot you have to infer and guess. Right, but all the information is... Pre- you see, you know the and guy, you know the, that Gavin is dead, you know the chick's in an insane asylum, and you know that the producers have the footage. Okay, what happens then, next is up for inferring, then but every, it presents then, enough information. Th- then the, this movie also shows you that the hotel is haunted, right? Yes. Then, therefore, Kenneth's theory that a ghost moved the chair is presented in the movie and backed up by the movie. It's plausible. But they don't show the ghost doing that. Like in Poltergeist, the ghost moved the furniture. In this, they show up as old but party they show, guests to make But Jack they show crazy. that ghost. But uh, no, because the ghost unlocks Jack's door when yes. he's trapped. Therefore, they're showing that the ghost can touch physical objects and have effects well, on them. I didn't say them. that they couldn't touch physical objects. I'm just saying so that how is it a So how is it a stretch that they didn't? they can't just move a chair? I think it's, it's a stretch to say that why didn't Wendy fucking see it? <laughs> But I, I don't, I don't, I feel like they do give you the information in the movie. You just, you really have to put different pieces of the puzzle together. But like, even with the chair, I can find shit in the movie and I'll prove it. Cause when we get to the theories, I created my own theory on okay. what this movie means. And I think when I do that, you're going to, you will understand what I say when I say the movie gives you everything you need to create whatever the fuck you want out of it. Well, Jerry, why don't you get into it, man? Yeah, no, gonna, because I need, to, I, need, I need things to I need things to happen before I get to theories. There's other stuff I've got to go over. You've got to go over your book stuff because that All plays right. into my theories. So I would rather uh, if Jay, if you're good, yep, uh, I'll move on to mind for now, and we'll uh, come back to yeah. My Kenneth, thoughts. drop your review of watching the movie this time. Just watching it, or do you want me to go into um, all my stuff? Uh, don't go in the. Just give us your opinion on the movie this time. Um, and then in here in a moment, we'll get into, uh, the book. Visually, the movie is fucking beautiful. I mean, it is a gorgeous, gorgeous movie, especially for the time period that it came out. I mean, for 1980, you didn't see movies that were this fucking stunning around 1980. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. The set design is fan fucking tastic. I love how seamlessly everything is done that way. So it, it was a gorgeous fucking movie. Um, the, the, the score of the movie, I, at, and I'm not going to lie as well done as it was, there were some times where it was just, inter- it, it, it was just irritating and it took me out. I'm not going to lie. There were some times that it did, you know, because, cause I watched this movie with headphones on and with oh. headphones on. Yeah. With headphones on that fucking, the, the really high pitched stuff that was going on in the score was just like there and in your face because you know you don't want to turn it down so you can clearly hear the people talking because i don't know what it is about streaming services but you know it's almost like they assume that everybody that watches has fucking you know those old school surround sounds and and so the fucking the the dialogue is really really low but all the other shit's fucking goddamn just dynamic yeah who put it on commercial setting can we not do that I mean, it's just, it, it's insane. So you have to like turn it up so you can hear what the people saying. And then when the music or the, or in action movies, the explosions come in or stuff like that, it's just like, it's too much. But, uh, but other than that, I mean, I, I'm, I, I've said it earlier. I'm not a big fan of Shelley Duvall. I do not think that her acting was that great in this movie. I could see where all the, all the, all the talks of how Stanley Kubrick really didn't, they didn't really get along. I can see that. Because you know, really- Kubrick ended up saying that uh, her performance was um, absolutely perfect. I don't. I, okay, well, you know, maybe he said that in trying to make things better from all the other shit. I don't know. He maintained for the rest of his life that her performance was absolutely 
perfect. And she even said, because uh, I, I have a whole thing on the cast and Kubrick, uh, and she even said that uh, in the end it was all worth it because it was one of the best performances of her life. Yeah, well, uh, that I completely disagree. And, uh, you know, if he maintained that for the rest of his life, good for him. He also made Eyes Wide Shut, and that fucking movie was terrible. Yeah, it was. Um, so, you know, I mean, I, I didn't I didn't really care for her acting. I think the little boy did decent for, for what he was. I didn't really care for Dick Halloran's acting. It was okay. Um, I think Jack Nicholson... Character. Say what? I said he's my favorite character. I think uh, Jack Nicholson's fucking acting was great. You know what I'm saying? But that just comes back down to he's Jack Nicholson. He's pretty much the same dude in every movie he's in. Um, so, but I think his acting was great. I am in complete agreement with you that going up the stairs, it, it just fucking gives me a chub every time I fucking watch it. That That's one of my favorite scenes. Um, so overall, I mean, I think it was great. I love the, the way the movie is shot to give you that, that sense of terror. Like I was describing in my rant that i went on earlier so overall i really enjoyed it i think it's i i I think it's a really good movie aside from the fact of how far it's straight away from the source material yeah and we'll get into that um here in a bit uh that'll be in the kubrick versus king section Mm -hmm. um is that is that it for your just review yeah that's just my general take on the movie so I want to bring up something that I found in my research real quick, um, and I brought this up to Dave Z. And while he we he you know we he did have like some possibilities of what it could be, he actually had said he he'd never noticed it before. The blood elevator, um, it's the same shot used oh, multiple yeah, times yeah. throughout the the movie. Um, so if you slow it down and watch it, there is some kind of solid object that seems to fall out of the elevator during the blood coming down. Um, and I, I, I watched this video where it slowed it down and pointed out and no one knows what it is to this day. No one knows what it is. No one can figure out what shape it is or fucking anything. You can just tell there's something solid there. Um, people have talked about it being, uh, uh, like the blood congealing doesn't really look like that. And, um, I, and there's a behind the scene thing where they show them, uh, sweeping all the blood and it just looks too liquidy to be something that would congeal. Um, and experts have said that the, that it de- that they don't think that's what it was. People have said that maybe it was the blood bag falling and it being caught in there. And I just don't think, I just don't think that that's something that would have happened. Um, not on the miniatures they were doing. Uh, cause that would have made that blood bag fucking tiny. Uh, and with the amount of blood they were throwing, it wouldn't be that tiny. Um, so, the 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 fucking elevator scene took almost a year to film. Um, technically, it only took three takes to get it right, but it took almost uh, nine days for it to for them to set up to do the shot, and they couldn't just constantly do it over and over again. They had to like do it and then you know get processed. Kubrick would look at it and go. Blood doesn't look real enough. I, it doesn't look like blood. I don't want it. And they would ha- and it would take them months before they would be able to come back to it after fixing the blood, resetting up the shot, fi- cleaning and fixing the models, blah, blah, blah. So it took them a year to actually get this right. So the next time you're watching The Shining, or go to YouTube and watch it, um, tell me what it is. Uh, Dave Z said uh, maybe it was Grady, the former keeper who killed his daughter, his twin daughters and his wife with an axe. Maybe it's one of his daughters. Maybe it's his fucking wife. Who knows? But I, I didn't notice it in the movie until it was pointed out to me and I watched a bunch of YouTube videos Holy on it. Holy shit. What, are you on that scene too? Yeah. You could be... Okay, so you, really you do need to watch like the slowed down videos of it to see it really clear because it goes away really quickly. There's a part where the blood splashes up on the wall and kind of does the wave where it falls over. And at that point, you lose it. You can't see it anymore. Yeah, there's clearly something there. But there is something there. Uh, it's ridiculous. So I, I would just say watch the slow down videos on YouTube. It's it's fucking crazy. Sorry if y'all are hearing that knocking in the background. It's my cat in the litter bars. Oh, fatty cat. It's okay, fatty cat. I love you. 
Um, what okay. Fuck? What the fuck? Yeah, I, I right? Dude, fuck? no one can figure it out. In this movie where people, like, go over every fucking detail, like, they have a comb in the desert from Spaceballs, no one knows what that is. Damn, fat cat. God. <laughs> yeah, cats have horrible poop. Okay, um... So, one thing I want to point out here with uh, the cast is Shelley Duvall. It is known very well that uh, Shelley Duvall did not have a good time filming this. Um, a lot of actors say it's really hard filming with Kubrick, but it's worth it. And even Shelley Duvall did it. But, like, Kubrick went out of his way to make sure Shelley Duvall was miserable and her hair was falling out. She said she lost the ability to cry and had to carry on water and be hydrated. There's a scene in the making of where Vivian, Kubrick's wife, uh, is like trying to comfort her. And St- Stanley comes in and is like, don't do that. It doesn't help her. Um, Damn. And Shelley Duvall is kind of an insane wreck. She hasn't really been in a movie since like 2002. She is pretty much done for. I really don't like her as an actress. So I really, it, I, that's, I think it was a good thing for <laughs> For movies, if she's yeah. not in anything, because I really don't like her. And, and one thing I wanted to bring up is this quote that I found on IMDb. Uh, Jack Nicholson and Shelley Duvall have expressed open resentment against the reception of this film, feeling that critics and audience credit Stanley Kubrick solely for the film's success without considering the efforts of the actors, crew, or the strength of Stephen King's underlying material. Nicholson and Duvall have said it, that the film was one of the hardest of their careers. In fact, Nicholson considers Duvall's performance the most difficult role he's ever seen an actress take on. Duvall herself also considers her performance the hardest of her life. Hmm. Uh, so that's something I want to tackle because when people talk about Kubrick, um, they always talk about his treatment of Shelley Duvall. Um, I mean, I'm, like I said, whatever. You know what I mean? I mean, she's, I, I just didn't care for it, but yeah. you know, I mean, I can, I can, I can respect after watching all the behind the scenes shit that I've watched, the the difficulty of working on it, especially when working with somebody like Kubrick. When you're fucking goddamn, you know, from the act, the way the actors talk about it, where you're 120 takes in, you know, I can imagine saying the same thing 120 fucking times in a row. Yeah, I mean, just the stare scene was done almost 70 times. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. Yeah. Didn't he make her smoke when she didn't too? She no, she she smoked. There's scenes of her all uh, on the set just smoking cigarettes. Right, but I thought it was because he made her start smoking for the movie. Oh, I didn't see that. Maybe I didn't see that. In I could my be research, wrong. I could have sworn that's just something. I'm gonna look at, it up while you guys keep talking. At this point, I feel like there's so much research to that I could still do on this movie that I just didn't get to that. I didn't even get through all of IMDb's trivia. There's that fucking much. But it's ridiculous. But I mean, you know, working with somebody like that for for that number of takes, I mean, it would have to drive somebody insane. But then again, you know, look, think about how many how much how many hours of footage that Kubrick would have to go through to get what he really wanted. I mean, like, there's this one scene um, where uh, uh, she's talking about leaving the hotel and she's sitting on the bed with Jack. I think it's right after the the 237 uh, lady gets Danny and she's sitting on the bed and he comes back after that and he says he didn't see anything in the room and she's just like, you know, maybe we should take Danny out of here and he fucking goes from seeming like he gives a shit about his kid to fucking, what the fuck are you doing or do you care about my work or something like that and they're sitting on the bed together. I mean, that's an intense fucking scene, especially when you're looking at Jack Nicholson's performance of it. That's probably one of the biggest spots in the movie, in my opinion, where he doesn't seem like Jack Nicholson. He seems like, a, you know, he seems like an actor outside of Jack Nicholson. So, you know, that I can see. But again, think about that. Think about doing that exact same thing a hundred yeah. fucking fifty times. It's ridiculous. Though some people uh, from the cast and crew claim that uh, no shot in the movie was ever done over a hundred times, and that's ridiculous. But it's in the Guinness World Record book. Yeah. So, who knows? Uh, so the next part we're going to get into is uh, King versus Kubrick. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, Stephen King, and he basically said, "Fuck this movie." Mm-hmm. 
Uh, he said the movie is a pretty car with no engine. Uh, and I want to read some things I found off IMDb before I hand it over to Kenneth for him to get into some differences. But um, So as we know, uh, in 1997, a television version of The Shining was made. So I found this interesting little tidbit that I thought y'all would get a kick out of. The Shining was eventually readapted as a 1997 miniseries that followed Stephen King's book more closely because of his dissatisfaction with Stanley Kubrick's adaptation. However, Kubrick owned the rights to the 1980 adaptation, so in order for King to get the rights to readapt his own book into a miniseries, Kubrick was required uh, to give permission. So Kubrick made King signed a legally binding contract that forced King to no longer be able to bring up his frequent public criticism of Kubrick's film, except for the sole commentary that he was disappointed with Jack Nicholson's portrayal of Jack Torrance as though he had been insane before his arrival at the Overlook Hotel. It's kind of funny when you think back about what I said earlier about Jack Nicholson being angry at critics that they only give Kubrick um, props for the movie and not the actors. And the one thing that, uh, you know, 17 years later that Kubrick's like, no more talking shit about my movie in public, Steven. But you can't talk about how you don't like uh, Jack Nicholson's betrayal of the character. Now, keep in mind, G Stephen King was also very, very against Shelley Duvall's character in the movie claiming that uh kubrick had turned that character into the biggest misogynistic uh character of all time and that's actually i would have to say pretty accurate yeah because, because in the book you know wendy is a very very strong woman she's she is she is 100 percent into you know um uh, taking care of her son, making sure that Danny's good. Um, she clearly in more than one occasion points out how fucking ridiculous that, that everything is going and that Jack is acting a damn fool. And that, you know, uh, she clearly points out that she thinks the hotel is having an effect on, I mean, all kinds of shit. I mean, she ain't, she ain't just this, you know, okay. Okay. You know, like she does the first time that he walks in there uh, the first time that she walks in there and starts talking to Jack while he's at the typewriter and she's just like, okay, you know what I'm saying? No, she don't act like that. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was very interesting that, um, Kubrick did that. Um, and I, and I want to say it's very interesting. Like you can go and read all the shit Stephen King has said about it. I'm not going to fucking go into all that cause I could, I've got notes on it, but I don't y'all, y'all know Stephen King doesn't like this book. He explains why, Multiple times saying that he doesn't think uh, Kubrick understands how horror movies should be made or what horror even is, uh, how he ruined the book by going so far away from it um, and not really talking about the evils of alcoholism and the disintegration of the family unit, um, blah, blah, blah. But what else is interesting, as you go through the IMDb trivia, you find info on just the book constantly as if someone went in there to constantly remind you that th there's a book version of this. Like, there's one in there that, like, this is in the movie's trivia. Um, Peter Straub said this is, the, this is obviously a masterpiece. Probably the best supernatural novel in a hundred years. He's not talking about the movie. He's talking about the novel. Right. And it's in the IMDb trivia for the fucking movie. And there's tons of shit in there about not just like them pointing out differences, but little shit about that's just about the fucking book that has nothing to do with the movie. It so be. I thought that was really fucking weird. Uh, I, and you're right. Probably people want, it, want you know, there's somebody out there or other people out there, somebody that works for IMDb to make sure that people know that there is source material that this is based off of. Yeah. You know. Um. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kenneth and let Kenneth tell us what are some of the differences in the novel that uh, are changed from the movie, and uh, we'll, we'll let's do some learning. Go ahead, Kenneth. Um, let's start. Uh, would you, we'll start with uh, Tony. Okay, Tony is not just a little boy that lives in Danny's mouth in the book. Tony is an actual physical apparition that Danny sees. Um, he usually at the beginning of the book, if I'm not mistaken, he starts off very far away 
and he's beckoning for Danny to come to him. And as the book progresses, he gets closer and closer, and there's moments where he gets stronger, and then once he gets to the hotel, he kind of fades out. And the reason, and, and you know, spoiler alert for uh, for those of you out there who have not read the book, Tony is actually the future self of Danny, trying to warn his younger self through The Shining that all this shit's gonna happen at the Overlook. Yeah, Danny's middle name in in the book is Anthony. Yeah. Oh. And so, yeah. So that's that's one of the big things that was left out that that a lot of people don't know. Um, another one, the maze did not exist. Yeah. There was, uh, they had topiaries. Yeah. They had, um, animal shaped topiaries out there that came uh, alive, right? Yeah. That came alive. And Stanley Kubrick thought that it would be too silly. So that's the reason why he didn't put it in the movie and changed it to the, the, the maze. Well, he said it would be too silly because they didn't have the technology to make it look good. Right. And uh, in 1997, they didn't then either. No, because well, they it did. Looked, they just didn't have the money for it. Yeah, because I've got that one on DVD too, and it looks fucking awful. Um, but yeah, that's one of them. Um, there's a lot that goes into Jack. Is a, a, a his nickname is Jack in the book. His name is actually John in, in the book. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that goes into him as a character. He's a lot thicker in the book. I mean, naturally, most of the time they are. But he's a lot thicker, like, into his alcoholism and, and, and stuff like that. You know, he doesn't just dislocate Danny's arm in the book. He breaks Danny's arm in the book. Now, uh, didn't he, uh, in the book, he, he has a job before he takes this job where he, he's a school teacher. Right. And he gets fired for like punching a kid or something. Yeah, he got into a fight with a kid because uh, I can't remember exactly what it was, but the kid disagreed with something that he said, and he ended up going out and fucking flattening Jack's tires, and Jack caught him, and they ended up getting physical, and yeah, Jack got fired from the from there, and so that ended up happening. He was in the middle of writing a play. That's another thing about the uh, about the movie versus the book in the book that all work and do- and no play makes jack a dull boy that's not in the book at all he actually was working on something when he he was working on a play when he when he goes to the overlook and then when he gets there he starts getting interested in the history of the overlook and he comes across the scrapbook and some other stuff and he actually decides while he's there that he's going to write a a history of the overlook hotel while he's there um, so he actually is working on writing while he's there. But and there's a small thing in the movie that does hint at all of that. Because uh, at one point, that scrapbook is in the movie. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, there is a scene earlier in the movie where it's on the desk. Yeah, yeah. You can see it sitting there. And uh, But, you know, I honestly have to say, even though in the book, well, all, all that. But I thought the when I actually really like that scene also. But my favorite thing about that scene is when you're looking at the the all work and no play on the on the on the sheets of paper it actually looks like paragraphs and shit and different shapes and and different ways that books are written i thought that yeah. was really really one of good one of them's done like a screenplay yeah i thought that was awesome i was like wow this looks really really good but uh but yeah so that wasn't in there i mean that um da, 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 da. there was a lot more work that jack had to do to the hotel during the winter time um, and there, and obviously if you really want to do a whole lot of research, there's little things that I'm leaving out. I'm just trying to go over the big ones. Um, he was supposed to do a lot more work. So he was supposed to keep up with the boiler to, and, and he was supposed to systematically make sure each wing of the hotel was warmed at a certain amount of time. So the elements, and they kind of go over that in the book, in the, in the movie a little bit, but not to the level that he was supposed to in the book. Um, he was also supposed to reshingle one of the wings of roof. Um, he was supposed to do other things, you know, all kinds of shit all over the damn hotel, which I think is crazy because he's a school teacher, but he's like a jack of all trades. So he knows how to do all this shit. Uh, so they go over that real thick. Um, the, the Danny at the beginning of it, he actually sees all kinds of stuff about the Overlook hotel. It's not just small little flashes. It's like, you know, he sees the thing about red rum. He sees the blood. He sees, uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff. I can't remember it all. He sees the thing about it's actually room 217 in the book. It's not 237. He sees the oh, thing yeah. about 
and I want to address the myth on this. Uh, a lot of people claim that the hotel asked for them to change it to room 237 because they didn't want people to be scared right. of uh, staying in room 217, I think mm-hmm. it was. Uh, apparently, that hotel that that's filmed in, uh, well, that hallway is filmed in, doesn't have a room 217 anyway. Um, and uh, most of the inside rooms were not filmed at a hotel. They were filmed on a sound stage. Most of the shots were filmed on a stage. Yeah, a lot of this movie is filmed like 90% on 90 percent of it. Um, and the outside hotel is like three different di- different hotels. Um, there's not one single hotel. So a lot of that myth uh, is kind of dumb and why he changed it to 237 will cover in one of the theories. But uh, there's no clear, uh, absolute answer. No. And I think the entirety of the interior of the hotel is a, is a soundstage. I think the whole thing of the interior. I think all of it is. Um, but, yeah, I mean, so he, Danny sees all that stuff. So he doesn't really get it. But he, he can also read other people's minds. Um, the Shining is actually very – his clairvoyance is a lot stronger in the book than it is. He's also a very intelligent kid. Like, he's very articulate. Um, you know, so they kind of make him seem like, you know, he's this down, you know, kind of – it's hard to describe him in the movie. But in the book, he's not like that at all. He's actually very upbeat. Um, he's aware of his gifts. Um, he um, – you know, he just don't understand it a lot of time. Like there's this one scene where uh, one scene, there's this one, there's this one bit in the book where Danny reads this chick's mind and she's coming out of the hotel and she's looking at the bellboy and she makes this comment about how she'd like to get in the bellboy's pants. And he, and as a kid in his kid mind, he doesn't understand that. And so he's kind of like halfway back and forth about whether he's going to ask his mom or his dad about getting into somebody, some about why she would want to get into his pants. And then he thinks better of it and he doesn't do it. So I thought that was really cool in the book because it goes, you know, it, it kind of gives that childlike of how he's dealing with this thing and knowing that he's, that, that he's got this gift, but at the same time, his childlike mind can't, get some of the stuff that he's seeing he can't figure it out because he just doesn't have the experience in life you know i think it's really yeah. cool um and uh jack does not chase him around with an axe he chases him down with a rogue mallet or rope okay roke it's not croquet it's something different oh in the movie they use a croquet palette yeah, yeah well the, cro- the mallet 1970 movie yeah the mallet is the same for croquet. It's, it's almost the same for croquet, but the name of the game is actually called Roke. It's something oh, different. Uh, yeah, it's something different. And uh, uh, that's what he chases them around with, which I personally think the axe is a lot more terrifying. And uh, he ends up hitting his wife in the leg and breaking her back, I think. Um, and let's see he chases danny around the hotel obviously there's no going out in the maze or any of the rest of that shit and uh danny makes jack aware of the boiler and how jack hasn't been paying attention to it and there's nothing that they can do it's going to explode and then at the last minute jack kind of comes out of it and fucking tells danny to run and that's how they get away dick halloran does not get killed he survives and he's the one that helps them get away in the in the in the snow cat yeah oh also i want to bring i forgot to bring that up kenneth uh how the fuck did dick halloran get from miami all the way back up there doing a gigantic fucking snowstorm in that little bit of time we're talking about planes had to been grounded we're talking about movie or book movie the only the only thing in the movie anywhere where they say anything about this is when he's in the car headed to go get the snow cat after he gets off his plane. And it says something about, at that point, planes are now being grounded. That's Yeah, it's just bullshit, because there's already tons of fucking snow. Right. But, I mean, I, I would imagine that, you know, if you think about it, I mean, I don't, I, as far as I know, you've never lived up north. I don't live up north. And so, you know, I would imagine that, damn, when they get heavy snow up there, planes aren't always stopped. I figure the airports and fucking... Goddamn, you know, some of these places just keep on kicking. Okay, fair enough. 
So I think it has to get to a certain point. But it's the same thing as, you know, like living down here in the South, man. I mean, we get fucking, you know, five or six inches of snow and goddamn everything shuts down. You go to some place like Michigan and they get four or five fucking feet and they and everything just keeps on rocking and rolling. You know, next thing you know, you see the trucks outside with fucking salt and goddamn whatever shoving snow off the road. You know, True. it's uh, it, I, I think it's just a difference in, you know, us not having to deal with that. I don't know, Jay, you live up north. Uh, yeah, but I live in the, the northwest and uh, it doesn't really snow too bad over here. Oh, OK. Like in areas it does. So, the, so they have to uh, they have to close the pass. Uh, where there's a pass. To, to go over a mountain and every once in a while it snows so bad on that mountain that it has to uh, that it has to snow actually if I'm not mistaken one of the biggest uh, exterior shots for the hotel that they used for the overlook the hotel it's in Oregon is, it's actually in Oregon so yeah yeah the, yeah they like I said they there was like there's multiple those used uh, like because there's a uh, the shot with Jack in the beginning are sitting reading his magazine waiting for them to show him around the uh hotel like that's not at the, the hotel that everyone goes to thinking it's the hotel from the shining so it's it's interesting shit like that uh, but do you have anything else from the book uh i mean that's pretty much i mean the they go into a lot more about you know the visions of ghosts that that jack sees um they go a lot more into that um they go a lot more into his alcoholism and how bad it was um it was actually really really bad um you know to the point of where they don't really go into the physical that he goes through where he has the shakes and stuff like that i mean they really go into it in the book um uh his best friend hired him for the job at the overlook and actually olman couldn't fucking stand it did not want jack to work there um, do, 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 do. those are the main things that I can remember off the top okay. of my head. But but Jack dies from the, the from the entire hotel exploding at the end of the book. Oh shit! Yeah, the entire hotel explodes when the boulder. Does Jack when the, kill when anybody the, in the book? Uh, do, 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 do. no, I don't think I don't think so. Tell you the truth, because the, the book is more about the effects of alcoholism or addiction or the negative effects you can have on your family based off your own selfishness oh yeah, yeah absolutely i was just curious yeah it definitely has that under that underlining fucking social commentary about shit like that between isolation and and what's going on and all the rest of that i mean because like i said jack actually really cares about his family you know versus in the movie where he just seems like he fucking can't stand having a family all the way around from the yeah beginning. That, and that's one of the things King complained about is that he felt like that in the movie Jack, it almost seemed like Jack was insane from the get go. Right, and and in the book he's not. You know, like when he broke Danny's arm, he fucking felt awful about it. You know, it it wasn't one of those things where you know, like when like in the bar scene, um, where he's sitting there and he's just like, you know, he he was mad and I pulled him and blah blah blah. It wasn't nothing like that, man. I mean, he genuinely felt awful about it in the book. That was one of the things that pushed him to quit to quit drinking, um, you know. And he did it on his own with the help of of one of his buddies. But it was mainly they got into they were driving and they got into some accident. I can't remember exactly how all that went, but uh, that was the other part of it. And uh, so the whole thing, him and his him and his best friend, they 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 decided to get sober. And it was it was that best friend that got him the job at the Overlook. Gotcha. Mm. Okay. Well, all right, guys, it is time for theories. So I'm going to go over a couple of theories that are in the documentary room 237. I'm not going to go super deep. This is more just kind of I'm going to read a theory and we're going to say whether it's bullshit or not or we think it could be or just our reaction to it. Then I'm going to go into a uh, theory that I really like but is not in room 237. And then I'm going to go into my own theory. So, uh, room 237 is basically, let me tell you why the printer means the Holocaust and the window in the office definitely means something because of how bright the light is. Uh, this is, and this is what I was talking about earlier where no one believes that Kubrick can commit a fuck up. Um, well, and they, they, and they take every little thing as something. So we're going to go. Wait, 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 wait. What? The light is too bright from the window in the office. 
Uh, yes, in the office uh, where he's getting interview, the uh, light is too bright in the window, and that obviously means something. The lady in the documentary never tells me what the fuck it means, but she says it means something. Oh, okay, whatever. I yeah. mean, the only thing that I find interesting about that that I completely agree with is if you actually look and pay attention to the way everybody walks around in that set, there's no way physically possible that there could be a window to going to the outside. Yeah, yeah, they talk about that. Um, okay, so we're going to go into one of the biggest uh, ones, which it, the first like two theories that could technically be together. Uh, the, the first one I call White Man's Burden. Uh, the movie is about Europeans committing genocide against Indians. In the doc, they talk about the elevator of blood and how since the elevator goes down into the ground where we can assume the Indian burial ground is. Oh, I got to say this uh, uh, every change made in the movie from the book means something in a theory. Most theories are based on, uh, it means this because they changed it from the book. Why else would they change it? It has to mean something. So the fact that they mentioned that this is on an Indian burial ground, um, and that, uh, you can see Indian stuff all over the hotel. Um, especially the scene where, uh, Holleran shining talks to, uh, fucking, Danny Damn. about ice cream, and you can see the can right behind his head of the Indian head. Mm -hmm. uh, Wasn't there something else. about the tang cans too? Maybe, um, but like, there's too much. I didn't get all of it. Um, so uh, they talk about how the elevator, the blood that's in the that comes out of the elevator is uh, Native American blood because the elevator goes down into the ground. Uh, where the Indian burial ground is. Uh, the elevator doors... Okay, they also say... One of the guys in there says the elevator doors do not open and the blood pours out the sides, um, saying that we can't keep repressing things. Um, but the problem is, is the door fucking opens. We see the door fucking open. So I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. How, I don't know how you're you're so big of a fan that you create all these theories for this. And you don't realize that the door fucking opens. It clearly opens. See, I think uh, when it comes down to it, and we talked about this before, I think that there's a possibility that there is some kind of Native American something in there. But do I think it's as extreme as everybody else is trying to make it out to be? Not. I don't. I don't think that every little minute detail is leading to it. I yeah. think there's stuff in there, you know, where he's clearly trying to say something. But do I think every little minute detail is that? No. So, uh, we do bad things and forget it, and the movie is meant to make us remember, um, you know, we're doomed to repeat the past if we forget it, blah, blah, blah. Which goes into the dream theory. Uh, the movie is made like a dream because of how our brains process dreams. They basically take what happened that day and apply it to the history of our life of everything we know. So, it's about the world's past atrocities and how the only way to do better is to have the shine to see the patterns in the dreams. So that you have the knowledge to retrace your steps like Danny does in the maze. Um, so that one is basically going, uh, scientifically, uh, our dreams are us dealing with uh, the information we learned that day. And putting it with all the other information we have learned throughout our life. Um, and this is saying that uh, we have to uh, know about the world's past atrocities. Because the only ways we will not commit those again is to be able to recognize the patterns. We need to have that shine that Danny has to, to see these things and know that, that if we retrace those steps, a.k.a. we relook at all the knowledge we have, we will be able to escape the maze instead of continually going in uh, repeating circled patterns. Okay. Uh, I actually do like this theory. Um... It technically makes sense. Uh, the movie does have a lot of dreamlike qualities. In fact, the uh, the big theory I'm going to get into that isn't in the documentary uh, deals a lot with dreams also. So I do like this one. Uh, this one is okay, that lady that talked about the window being bright but didn't say what it meant. She also brought up this whole minotaur thing that Jack is a minotaur. Oh, yeah. uh, I, saw, I, I think I saw something about that. Uh, yeah, because there's a maze in the hotel. And uh, there's this ski poster in the room, in the game room, where Danny's throwing darts. And you see the ski poster when the twins show up. Uh, it's on, if you're looking at your TV, it would be on the left side 
uh, right behind one of the twins. And there's a skier there. But in the movie, they specifically say that the area is not a good area for skiing. So why would there be a ski poster there? Well, when you look at the ski poster closer, the figure is actually kind of a black silhouette that actually looks like a minotaur. And then right across on the other side of the wall, there's a guy riding a bull, which is representative of a minotaur because it's a bull and a man put together. See, this is the Ta-da. kind of stuff that makes me go, you know, maybe it's just the posters they had lying around. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Oh, here's – okay. Now we go into uh, the – this is about the Holocaust. Uh, so the at the very end of the movie, they have the transition from uh, the picture of – the picture at the end, and then they transition it into a closer picture. Um, so in that transition, if you slow it down scene by scene, there are a few frames that give, uh, Jack in the picture a Hitler mustache. <laughs> uh, and then there, and all the connections to World War II and Nazis, uh, they all seem kind of a big stretch to me, like the, that the, the typewriter is German. Um, a lot of it is honestly just talking about, uh, so apparently Kubrick wanted to do a film called The Aryan Papers, which was about World War II, but he never did it because it was too depressing and just constantly got put off. Um, and then the fact that Jack specifically uses the three little pigs line, uh, in the movie is a reference to the Disney cartoon, uh, from the forties where the wolf is dressed up as a stereotypical stereotype Jewish person, uh, when he's trying to convince the pigs to come out and Kubrick would have seen that as a child. Okay. So, you know, Disney's racist y'all. Um, I think that was a fact at some point in time. Uh, yeah. Uh, so here we, okay, here we go. Here's the big one. Stanley Kubrick faked the Apollo 11 moon landing for the government. All right, I'm gonna just go eat some dinner. Uh, Uh, nope, you sit (laughs) down. So, uh, this one basically says that, uh, we might have still went to the moon, but the footage that was shown to us was 100% faked and directed by, uh, Stanley Kubrick. No, the story wasn't good enough. Um, so here we go. Uh, and it was faked using front screen projection, which he had been using on 2001 A Space Odyssey. So all the changes made in The Shining from the book all point to the guilt of Kubrick for his integrity and in lying to his wife and others. The main pieces of evidence is Danny wearing an Apollo shirt um, that he is on this like... He's on the floor and it's that famous shining pattern and as he steps okay so in the pattern you know it's like the hexagon with a line coming out of it on one side yeah so as he's sitting down the line is going towards it's facing him as he stands up it is switched and that line is no longer in front of him it's behind him and so it looks more like a launch pad as he stands up and the line back would be you know with a launch pad, they always have the line going back so they can all drive away. Um, uh, and then Jack having his tirade about contracts and responsibilities in the, uh, my favorite scene of the movie. Uh, and, you know, having responsibility to his wife and stuff. Uh, the changing of 217 to 237 uh, was also the, uh, s- the shooting stage that the moon landing was faked on. And it's approximately... Uh, 237,000 miles uh, from the Earth to the moon. Isn't that factually untrue? I do not know. Uh, I did I did not actually go try to, like, back up any of this shit. Because one, uh, co- well, like, all right, so, I, I, well, you say approximately, but, like, you know, I've watched one where it's, uh, where they were talking about some textbooks back then said that fucking goddamn, because apparently somebody specifically said that old textbooks had it in there that the the moon was 237,000 miles away and damn or million or whatever and damn the no no old textbooks say that most of them say it was either you know 240 something or 200 or approximately 250 you know what i'm saying but none of them say specifically 237 yeah, I I no clue. Um, so the key in the door for room two thirty seven also says room no, uh, with room no. being all capitalized, no room. and the n in no being capitalized, <laughs> but the o is not. 
Uh, the no uh, is a representation we when we do number. For some reason, we do n o period, and that means number. I actually don't know why we do that. I know it is a thing, but I don't know why we do that because there's no o in number uh, unless it's numbered order. But anyway, um, and uh, the only words you can make with uh, those with just using the capital letters is moon and room. So this is the moon room. Uh, I want to point out that this is bullshit because it's just common that when you do uh, N-O as a number, you capitalize N and you lowercase the O and you put a period on it. That's just how it's done. That's commonplace. So I, I think that's just kind of fucking dumb. Yeah, there was um, another, there was another uh, documentary that I listened to that fucking says that the the only words that you can make is moon and room, which is also factually untrue. There there there's like several others that you can make. Yeah, more M O O R. It's an every time I die song. Go listen to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, um, and granted, they're not common words, but they are technically words. Yeah. Uh. Um. So. Uh, this is my favorite thing, uh, that Kubrick, uh, was faking the making of a King film. Like he was faking the moon landing, uh, which is kind of true. He made a fake Stephen King movie. So I actually really like that one. Um, also the guy who created this theory, uh, has says that he has been visited by the government multiple times that he expects his taxes to be audited a lot and that NASA has talked negatively about him. But he does not deny that we went to the moon. He just thinks that Kubrick faked the footage. So, yeah, that's a, that's a fucking lot. I mean, it's... All right. You know, back in the time period, I can understand the reasoning behind why people think the moon landing footage was faked at the time. Because there was that race between, I think it was Russia and Russia America. Russia and America. Yeah. yeah, that race to f- see who the first one that could go to the, uh, they could get out into space. So I get it. You know, United States wanted to be the first to get out there and, uh, and whatever. I get that. But it's still another one of those things that I'm just like, I don't know. Because I, 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 if it was faked, I don't think Stanley Kubrick was the one that did it. And then also on top of that, that, that's just like all those other conspiracies that are out there. You mean to tell me that not one fucking person that was probably involved in that hasn't come out in fucking 50 fucking years? Well, I mean, they're they're scared of the reptilians uh, uh, because uh, the reptilians uh, have a deal with the U.S. government because oh uh, they had to get a deal before the Palladians came in. Cause fuck the Palladians, right? Um, oh, yeah, so, totally, I mean, it's, it's totally. It's a whole thing. Um, uh, maybe eventually, you know, they can fucking give actual legit proof that the Earth is flat while they're at it. Uh, and hollow at the same time. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, the moon is a hologram, in case everyone did not know. Oh, yeah. No, I actually have proven that. I was uh, walking through the woods down in Roswell one day. or Well, the desert, I guess. It's not really the woods. I yeah, tripped over say, this uh, metallic what? box, and the moon flickered off for a few seconds and then came right back on. So yeah. definitely yeah. a real thing. Because we all know Piccolo destroyed it. Don't <laughs> fucking Years lie. ago. Okay. Have some uh, fucking loot. Dragon Ball no. Z is actually a documentary about how the Earth was formed. Yeah. yeah, between Dragon Ball Z and Biodome, you know, Biodome is actually on a smaller scale of what the Earth is really like. Okay, the last theory I'm going to talk about from this documentary is uh, that The Shining is meant to be watched forwards and backwards at the same time. Oh, Jesus Christ. No, this is actually really fucking cool. Someone took the movie and superimposed the movie playing backwards on top of the movie playing forwards. And it's fucking cool, man. Uh, It's kind of like Wizard of Oz and Dark Side of the Moon lining up. Yeah. It's a bunch of coincidences, but it's super cool. Um... You know, but they're saying it's important that when that uh, in the movie you see people who walk backwards, like uh, uh, Wendy walking backwards up the stairs. You see people talk backwards and write backwards with uh, Danny and Red Rum. Uh, so they superimpose the film forward and backwards at the same time, and it's cool because uh, the, like there's the beginning of the movie uh, where the credits are the end credits uh, are rolling from the movie. And they happen to have the Jack Nicholson name. It lines up right with the car. Uh, And it's in the same spot where the framed pictures at the end of the movie 
lineup. Uh, it's Is this really on cool. YouTube? Um, it's in that Room 237 documentary. I would love to get a full video of it, of the whole movie, though. Because it's cool. Like, there's um, the the part where uh, they talk about the dude going crazy and killing his family in the interview mm-hmm. lines up exactly with Jack going crazy in the maze. Um, there's a lot of shots of Wendy being lined up with the twins. Like, it's a bunch of really weird... Like, there's lines up where, like, the TV that they're watching that has no power cord, which is weird, uh, that lines up and it's put right in between, uh, Grady and Jack Nicholson, uh, Grady and, uh, Jack talking in the bathroom. Interesting. Uh, which I'd could like represent to represent the fictitiousness of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's really fucking dope. I would love to... I actually want to try to find a copy of there. It's got to be on the internet somewhere. Some torrent site has to have this, and I've got to find it. It's probably the coolest thing in the fucking uh, documentary, and it's at the very end of the documentary, so you kind of have to watch it all the way through. Um, ooh, okay. So with that being said, I am about to go into, uh, and this is kind of long, but it is my favorite theory I found, and it's not in that documentary. Okay. You could stop me at any time if you need me to, but uh, it might make sense if I just read all of it. Up to y'all. So here we go. Uh, so this started out with me uh, making a joke. I said, uh, when I was watching the movie, this was a note I took while watching the movie. Uh, I mean, to prove the place is haunted, we have to have a furry giving a Republican a blowjob. <laughs> uh, because we have to show that Wendy sees the ghost show. So after doing some research, apparently this saw- scene... Ties in with the fact that Jack uh, may or may not be gay, but he has definitely sexually abused his son. The teddy bear that Danny lays on in the beginning of the movie has his eyes cut to look exactly like what's above the elevator doors, and it has an open mouth. Uh, You can actually find this model of teddy bear uh, as it was sold in the late 70s, and they, they purposely cut its eyes. The teddy bear that Danny lays on the beginning of the movies has I cut, so it looks like the other door, and it has. And the teddy bear also has its mouth open. When Jack arrives at the hotel and is waiting for the boss to show up to show him around, he is seen reading a play girl, and the front indicates an article about incest and why parents sleep with their children. The scene of Jack and Danny on the bed, where Danny asks if Dad would ever hurt him or Mommy, is apparently where the sexual abuse may have happened. When the scene ends and cuts to loud music uh, drop and the Wednesday title card, what we uh, didn't see is Jack forcing Danny to give him a blowjob, and that is how Danny got the marks on his neck. We know it's a blowjob because of the bear scene being identical to Danny brushing his teeth where, you know, frothy white stuff in his mouth. Kind of like it's weird that it was changed from the novel that Tony is a little boy who lives in his mouth and hides in his stomach, but is represented by a finger, a.k.a. a penis-shaped object. Uh, Danny has the dream about entering room 237 and then goes down to his mom sucking his thumb where she blames Jack, who just woke up from his own nightmare, where he thought about killing uh, them. Uh, Now, he wasn't actually dreaming about killing him. He was dealing with the guilt he had over hurting his son and sexually abusing him. Uh, Jack goes to drink it all off when Wendy shows up telling the story of what Danny said about there being a woman up there. Jack doesn't believe it because he knows the truth. So as he walks to go sleep it off, or as the film shows, to go investigate, he throws his hands up every time he passes in the mirror in the hallway because he cannot look at himself with what he's done. He then sleeps it off and has his own dream of guilt where he kisses a girl, but in the mirror he sees the ugly side of it representing what he did to Danny. The room 237 is just like the room Jack is staying on with the bed right before the bathroom and Jack also has the same hand gestures to Danny that the lady makes to Jack. We know Kubrick likes uh, to do uh, all these details. So in the scene where Wendy is checking instruments in the basement and Jack is having his nightmare about killing them in the walls, in that basement there are porno pics on the walls and a sign that says choking above what could be a river of blood with a possible bear face in the O inside the word choking. Woo. So uh, I really like this theory that it is uh, about uh, Jack sexually abusing Danny. 
and him not being able to deal with it. Um, it doesn't really explain like things being haunted, but you could pull off one of those like it's psychologically like they that like it is haunted, but you know the psychological trauma that Danny's going through and the guilt that Jack's going through and the suspiciousness that Wendy has is kind of uh, giving off energy that revs up these ghosts. So, uh, anybody got any thoughts on uh, everything I just said? I think that one is the most plausible one uh, yeah. that you've said. Yeah, I'll actually, you know, considering all the things that um, that is said about Stanley Kubrick, I could definitely see that one being thrown in there. That one's actually pretty good. Uh, um, you know, and it definitely it de- the the idea of the energy being given to the place and kind of revving everything up that actually kind of would i could see where he would get a thought like that from the source material because in the book the 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 hotel actually wanted Danny because of Danny's energy he wanted the, the hotel wanted Danny's energy so i could see wh- yeah so i could see where he would throw that for a yeah, loop and turn like- it into that I really like this theory. I think the uh, the changing because we talk about things that are changed in there uh, in the book. The bear blowing the old guy happens, but it's a dog. But in the, this, they change it to specifically a bear. Um, you know, and that kind of works out. And uh, they're like the changing Tony to a little boy that lives in his mouth that uh, ran, that hides in his stomach. If that doesn't represent semen, I don't know what does. Uh, I've always thought that was kind of, yeah, for lack of a better weird. term, phallic. Yeah, um, they're uh, Jack using our, uh, and then Tony's also represented by uh, a finger. Who That's hasn't? Phallic. Who, as a kid, has not uh, unzipped their pants and shoved their finger through their zipper, uh, pretending it I was a penis? I don't know if I've ever done that. Really? Yeah. Wow. You I mean, I'm not. T- I'm not trying to kid. detract. Obviously, my anecdotal answer has nothing to do with anything, but I just, uh... Well, let us just put this into the old computer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it turns out, Jay, uh, as a child, you were a dead fuck. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really fucking like this theory. And there's more to it. There, There is more examples to it. If, you, like, there's... I watched a fucking, like, almost 30-minute video on this. And I watched it, like, three times to try to get all the notes it brings, and I finally just gave up. Um, so it's really fucking, really fucking neat. I really like this theory. I think it's uh, how I'm going to see this movie. But what if I thought, you know, all these people make all these theories about this movie. Obviously, it's not that hard to do. So can I, in this day and age, in 2019, create a theory that no one else has made about this movie. So I gave it a shot. So I hope you guys are ready. And my whole point of this is, uh, this is how you make a theory for this movie. Uh, The point is to overreach by connecting characters to something in real life and using something in the background and the set to put it all together. That seems to be how most of these theories go. So here we go. And I do have things where I cite to prove uh, my theory. So here we go. The maze has tons of crosses. The maze is uh, mostly a, a, a matte painting, so you can argue that Kubrick added the crosses. He reportedly also talked to King about God and dying and hell. Kubrick said he doesn't believe in hell. Uh, and Stephen King replied um, that even if he didn't, people do believe in hell. And most of those people... Uh, who believe in hell, fear it worse than death. Um, In fact, when Stephen King was first approached by Stanley Kubrick about making this movie uh, during an early movie morning phone call, uh, let me skip all the bullshit, Um, Kubrick immediately started to talk about how optimistic ghost stories are because they suggest that humans survive death. And then King said, what about hell? King asked. Kubrick paused for several moments before replying, I don't believe in hell. King replied, with uh, people who believe in hell and they fear it more than death itself. 
and this is tremendously effective in helping Kubrick understand the feel of the story. So the maze was constructed on an airfield near Estri Studios by weaving branches of chicken wire mounted on empty plywood boxes. The maze was shot using an extremely short lens, a 9.8 millimeter, which gives horizontal viewing angle of 90 degrees, which was kept dead level at all times to make the hedges seem more bigger and more imposing than they were in reality. I bring all that up because all of that information about the hedge being created for the movie, that a lot of it was a matte painting, uh, even though it was physically built somewhere, and Stephen King and Kubrick's talk about ghost, hell, and God matter. So here we go. Uh, the So all of this um, uh, is representation of God giving his only begotten son to forgive his sins of the earth. So this is Jack being the vengeful God of the Old Testament, going to kill his only begotten son to forgive the world of his atrocities of Indians and war crimes and Nazis. Wendy is Judas who has delivered her son to the place uh, at the behest of God and his plan. She basically turns Danny over to the place where he is to be sacrificed. Uh, and uh, the reason Jack is God is because of the scene where Jack is standing looking at the model of the maze. And as it zooms in, he sees uh, Wendy and Danny inside the maze surrounded by crosses. Uh, and I did check. There are multiple crosses. So, uh, Okay. Um, but this time, but in this timeline, Wendy fights, uh, and Jesus fights the sacrifice because it's not all equal. One person can't die to save the world. One person cannot die and have all sins forgiven. One person dying, uh, only stops that one person from physically affecting, uh, other people. Jack dying meant he can't hurt them anymore. Hitler dying means he can't hurt the Jews anymore. God dying means he can't hurt the earth anymore. The movie is about atheism and rejecting an outdated world that is used uh, that uses those methods to hurt. Standing up and saying enough is enough. The mother must protect the child from standard rule and evolve past it. So, that is how easy it is to create any kind of theory about this movie. My theory has just as much proof and just as much... Uh, personal Kubrick views in it to be just as steady as any of the Nazi ones, the Native American ones, the dream ones, the moon ones, all of that. It's not hard to make a theory about this movie. All you've got to do is figure out which characters represent what in the real world, find something in the background uh, that you can use as some kind of sign, and then take something you know about Kubrick and put it in it. So, with that being said, do you, what do y'all think of my theory about this movie representing how the world needs to turn to atheism? <laughs> I think <laughs> that your statement, my theory is just as plausible as any other, is correct. And I think that plausibility <laughs> is zero. Just like every other theory, as you said, it's basically just manipulating what you want to mean whatever you want. That's that's very true, but that's what religion does. Yes. And maybe that's why Cooper made the way he did so that people would manipulate whatever they want to view whatever viewpoint they want, making every other theory uh, backing my theory even more. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's good. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you credit. That's good. Uh, Kenneth, what do you what do you think? I'm thinking about my own theory now. Let's see what I can come up with. See, this is I about literally the created Turtles this theory in how... like No, I legit I create I created this theory in about five minutes. Um I just so ha- be happened to um be rewatching the movie. It's like it was like my uh third time rewatching the movie, and it happened to be on that scene where Jack is looking down at the head at the, at the maze and I saw all these crosses that are are clearly visible um and that kind of made me think about it and then um i was uh also scrolling through uh imdb trivia and i saw these these comments between kubrick and, and king about uh life after death and hell and god and uh it made me think well what well shit maybe he's an atheist um 
you know, uh, maybe there, maybe there's something to this. So I started thinking about Jesus and I started thinking about, uh, the sacrifice. And I've always had this big thing where like, I've never understood the sacrifice of Jesus, um, to quote Doug Stanhope, uh, how does him dying for your sins equal? Like I hit myself in the foot for your mortgage. Doesn't make any sense. Um, and I've always thought it was weird that God couldn't just easily forgive everyone's sin. Instead, he had to do this whole big horse and pony show and uh, commit adultery with a woman and have her get pregnant and then fucking have that child get raised just to beat the shit out of him and murder him. Uh, instead of just going, you know what, guys, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna fucking forgive you. So taking that and putting it inside of a movie is a horse and pony show. Having it represent um, Danny being Jesus, Danny being the lamb, which is, you know, specifically one of the foods that they can eat that Holleran points out to them. Uh, and uh, then Holleran specifically asking Danny if he wants, like, ice cream made me think that Danny is a representation of food, so he's a representation of the lamb, so he's a sacrifice. Um, and the reason I said Wendy is Judas is because Judas is the one that delivers Jesus to the Romans for him to be killed, much like Wendy has brought her son uh, to this place and basically delivered him to be sacrificed. Uh, Jack being the Romans, a.k.a. the leading government, a.k.a. God, because in the Bible it says, I did not come to replace you know the local government. So you make those connections there. Um, and then you have... Uh, Wendy doing everything she can to fight it. Danny doing everything he can to get away from it and rejecting this idea that he has to do all this shit for others when that's not equal. It doesn't, it doesn't, there's no equality there. It doesn't, him dying to save others isn't going to change anything because a lot of the atrocities have already happened. God's already flooded the world. He's already asked someone to kill their son and then been like, no, nah, motherfucker, just playing. He's already sent a group of bears down to murder children who made fun of a guy who was bald. All these things have already fucking happened. Uh, much like this place has already been built on an Indian burial ground. The Indian genocide has already happened. The Nazis have already happened. The guy who murdered his children and wife has already happened. They can't save them. Him being a sacrifice, he's not actually sacrificing to anything except someone's story, someone's movie, someone's ego. So they fight back and they throw away these old traditions and uh, they say, no, there's got to be a better way. We have to find a better way. And they leave the old traditions to die. They leave them to die and they escape into the future. They get into a machine and leave while the other while the old traditions die by staying outside in nature instead of being in somewhere like a house where they can be warm into the future yeah, yeah you know uh so that's how i kind of came up with all of this uh how i kind of put this theory together uh and i and i look you know like I said, it's not hard to make a lot of these connections with this movie because there's so much you can connect with because the movie gives you all the answers and no answers at the same time. It gives you all the answers if you want to play, you know, connect the dots and look and find and create, you know, whatever fits whatever you're thinking of. But it doesn't give you the direct answer of what Kubrick was meaning because Kubrick died and didn't tell you. So make your own fucking thoughts. Connect the dots how you want them to be. So I did. And being that I'm a big proponent of atheism, uh, and that's how I, how my personal thing is, much like the guy who personally believes that the moon landing footage was faked, he just took what he already had inside of him and saw it in the movie. And that's what I did. A penis. A penis. A whole lot. I still like the fucking uh, Jack molested his son theory. But I think my theory is is fucking second after it. But I mean, seriously, like I want actual responses here about my theory. I, I think, gave you my response. Well, yeah, okay, that's true, Kenneth. I think it's a good one. Um, I you can definitely see your flair on your theory, because regardless of whether 
you know, you're you're a big proponent of atheism or whatever. Religion is a very, very strong topic for you all the way around, just like it is for me, even though I'm not an atheist. So I, you can definitely see, like, if there was anything, any kind of theory that I would think that you would go to watching this movie, it'd be something like that. I, I, I truly believe that. So, you know... I, I, while it was good, it, it's enjoyable to listen to. It's definitely one of those good things to think about. I'm not surprised that you came up with it. Yeah, it, it it's basically proof. You know, Jay said it earlier. A lot of people just see what they want to see in this movie, right? That's and so, feel. yeah, and so you know, I I think it's a good one. I think if you sat down and you thought about it, you could probably come up with several more. You know. Me, on the other hand, when I watch this movie and stuff, I can come up, if I wanted to, I could come up with theory after theory after theory. It's just, you know, I prefer to watch the movie at face value. And that's what's good for me, is watching it at face value. Looking at how aesthetically pleasing the movie is and how well it was put together and stuff like that. That's that's where I'm at. When it really comes down to, you know, all the other theories apart from yours, you know, the, the molesting him is actually a really good one. I think that's very plausible. But the one about the moon landing and stuff like that, uh, on top of ridiculous, I, I I really don't care. To be perfectly honest, you know, uh, I, yeah, I, I prefer to watch the movie at face value, you know, because and I think and I think part of the reason that I don't care about the ones that are outside of the two that you brought up, yours included, I think the reason why I don't is because it's like because of how ridiculous they get. You know, at the beginning of it, when you're first, when you're first, you know, checking out some of these details about some of these theories, you know, you're just like, oh, okay, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then when we get to the moon landing, I'm like, okay, I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's fun. Um, Like one of the reasons people like Game of Thrones is theory crafting. Uh, You can create all this stuff. It's... uh it's you know you can do that a lot with with uh novels that go over multiple books right but you, know, but we, you and i have talked about game of thrones and how much theory crafting do i really do yeah you don't and, and me i do theory crafting fucking constantly i i have a whole theory on how game of thrones ends tonight and it it's shot out and it's out there and it probably will not happen but if it does happen the few people who i've told it to are going to be like god damn jerry is this the so, last episode yeah, tonight's the last episode. Ever. It's over. Yes. Yep, done. Okay. Because I've heard from more than one person that this season has been fucking terrible. Uh, no. Uh, I'll, I can't go into it. I'm not going to go into it on the show, but um, no. Um, it's not terrible? No. Okay. Uh, Short answer is don't, no. Don't get me wrong. There's things that I do, I do not like. Is it terrible? No, it's not. I... I I was calmed down a lot when people told me how Dexter ended, and I was like, oh, okay. Ooh, we're good. It's not going to be that bad. Okay. But, yeah, man, I mean, it's just, like I said, I mean, a lot of times with things like this where it's fun to come up with things, and we do it on the show all the time about things that we think about and and, and things about the background and stuff like this, this movie is not one of those for me. You know, I prefer to watch The Shining at face value. I prefer, you know, it's like the movie is so aesthetically pleasing to me that I don't feel the need to spend time analyzing all the stuff that's in the background and stuff like that versus, you know, a movie like, like what we did when we did with Psycho or something like that, you know, where where we can pick it apart and stuff like that. I really don't feel the need to do it with this apart from what we've already done, you know, especially when it's not it's not theories about the characters and stuff like that. You're not, you're not making some of the theories are, you know, like the one about Jack and whatever. But when we get into stuff about the moon landing and stuff like that, it becomes not about the movie anymore. You know, the same thing about, you know, whether Stanley Kubrick put in the native American stuff in there, which I think was purposely put in there, but it's not about the movie anymore. It's not about the shining. It's about Stanley Kubrick. Yeah. It's kind of funny. The, uh, the main theory is that, that, that I enjoy, I enjoy the molestation theory the most because it involves the movie. Right. All the other theories, you're right. They don't involve my atheism. Once does not really involve the fucking movie. It involves my point of view. The the NASA one, the, or the moon one's the same one. The Nazi one's the same way. 
the Native American genocide is the same way. It's it's trying to put this big political message inside this movie and forgetting that, uh, you know, this movie has characters in it and it's supposed to be up about, about them. And I think that's one of the reasons that like, uh, Stephen King doesn't like the movie so much because he feels like the movie, you know, kind of moved away from the important thing of the characters about alcoholism and uh, the breaking down of the family. Right. And, 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 you know, I've heard, I've heard people talk about, you know, there's always those people out there that go into certain things and they look for all these underlining messages about what a movie's trying to say and stuff like that. And, you know, when it really comes down to it, a lot of times when I watch these movies, I don't, I, I, I'm watching these movies a lot of times because I want to escape from that bullshit. You know, I don't I don't want to sit down and, and, and think about in this particular case. I don't want to when I watch this movie, I don't want to think about the fact that, you know, the moon landing may have been faked. You know, I, I don't want to think about that. I want to think about, you know, the, what this child is going through as he's pretty much the he's he's in his own solitude apart from his parents living in this place and the only the place that he doesn't know he's at a young age he fucking damn is completely by himself he's cut off from the outside world he's cut off from other kids he's not getting the socialization that he needs for five months out of the year or six or seven however long it was i can't remember he's not getting the socialization that he needs and the only thing that he's seeing is these flashes of stuff that's happening in his mind from another plane of existence and these two little girls that fucking he sees they want to play with him and then a few flashes later he's seeing them all hacked up on the ground everybody's concerned about the moon landing and nobody's fucking taking the account of what the character of this child is going through book or movie yeah, except blowjob guy. He had that shit. Down. Right. You know what I'm saying? But you're right, because they talk about... Because uh, even before they go there for that isolation, they mention how Danny doesn't have any friends. Right. I mean... Uh, you know? So, and, and they have him seeing a, psychi- a child psychiatrist in the beginning of the movie. Like, there's something mentally wrong with this child. Yeah, so, um, so it's like, you know, what's going on with all these other kinds of things? And I'm not denying the fact that Stanley Kubrick was a great filmmaker. There's quite a few of his movies that I really enjoy, you know, apart from Eyes Wide Shut. I've really enjoyed A Clockwork Orange. I think that's a fucking fantastic movie. Full I still me- need a translation of that movie if anyone can, like translate what the fuck people are saying into like m- we'll wa- modern english we'll for watch me, it together one day i'd appreciate it we'll watch it together one day um because i've got it uh full metal jacket full metal jacket was a great well, movie no, uh, it's like i've seen the movie i need do you, i need someone to that's translate the reason why i'm saying. slang i said we'll watch it together one day and i'll do it while we're watching it oh okay um full metal jacket was a great fucking movie you know what I'm saying? I like the first half of the movie. I don't like the second I was second just half. about to say, it's almost like it's two movies in one, and it's two separate movies. But it's still, you know, but when it really comes down to it, that's what I want to see. I want to see the movie. He's a great filmmaker. He makes things look amazing. I really don't care about where his political standings and all the rest of that shit are, even if it's in it. I don't. So... You know what I'm saying? When when I when I pick apart a movie or when we do it on here, you know, I want what we pick it apart to be about to be about the movie and the characters in the movie and stuff like that. I really could care about shit outside of that. That's fucking God damn, that's a fucking good reply. Um You win because you know what but episode over. <laughs> I will say this. Um I enjoyed the shining more than I ever have during all this, but I think it was because I was researching and theory crafting and all that, and and I, I I'm burnt out. I don't want to see The Shining anymore. Uh, I think the next time I watch it, um, all I'm gonna think about is that kid sucking his dad's dick, and it's gonna bother me. <laughs> um, so I don't know if I ruined the shining for me which i don't know if i can ruin the shining for me because i i i was never a big fan of it to begin with i'm still not a big fan of it i i highly respect the film i think it's a great movie it's just not my cup of tea it does not have enough sugar in there for me um and but I, I, I go ahead i was gonna say even without the all the 
crafting and everything that you did and the research that you did on this movie, I didn't think you would ever watch it again after this show. Yeah. Um, and I want to say this. This is a movie that I've, you know, for I've been vocal about me not really liking it and that I think it's a great movie. I just don't like it. And uh, I always got the, um, well, you just don't understand it. You don't like it because you don't understand it. If you think at the end of this podcast that I don't fucking understand The Shining at this point, then I don't know if you were listening. I understand the movie in more fucking ways. Uh, fuck, I was literally fucking Doctor Strange uh, and Kenneth walked up and was like, so how many uh, different versions of The Shining did you watch? And I was like, all of them. And Jay was like, how many did you like? And I was like, none. That, like, I understand The Shining. Quit using the whole, uh, oh, if you didn't like it, it's just because you didn't understand it. No, it's just not my cup of fucking tea. I like different, I like a different flavor. This is not for me. Um, I got an idea. But I understand the movie. I got an idea. How about we talk about theories that actually have to do with the movie and we, and we, we, we see how we feel. How exactly do each one of y'all feel about or have a theory about how the movie ended? Not him. What you mean? Not him being frozen, but when the picture comes up and you see Jack in the picture from the twenties. Oh, uh, so I always assumed that this was um, the the ghost showing that they claimed a victim it reminded me of um house on haunted hill with vincent price right where the guy who owns the place constantly talks about uh oh they're gonna claim another victim they're gonna have another person i actually assumed it was kind of uh the the ghost way of showing that they were in control of jack and they own jack they they now have him yeah, see, I watched a video on on a theory about this, speaking of theories, and I actually kind of like this one. The theory is, is that Jack is a reincarnation of somebody that's already been there. It's like him doing, having to do, like, Brady? like hell. Like, it's his hell, and everybody else that's involved in it, it's their hell, and they have to keep redoing it over and over again. And the reason being is because in the scene where they're in the bathroom and he's talking to Grady. Grady makes a comment about how Jack has always been the caretaker and that he's always been there. And he also makes a comment about himself and how he's always been there. Yeah, because Grady was the pre was a previous caretaker, so that means that Jack and Grady would be the same person just at different re reincarnation times. Right. But it's Grady was they would have been alive at the same time. No. Yeah, Grady was just a couple years previous. But no, no, he wasn't. They didn't say he was a couple of years previous. They mention him, but they don't say when he is, I don't think. I don't remember whether they do or not. But either way. Maybe they do. But even if they do and they're two separate entities, either way, they've always been there. And so the the theory is is that Jack keeps fucking going through it over and over mm. again. Every time well, every time he's reborn, he's always lured back there, and he's always lured back there to bring his new victims in, which include that, his new family. That's a problem, though. Actually, if Jay's right and Grady was only a few was in the same time as Jack being but like alive, I, but like I said, all the people that are there. So it would include not just Jack. I, I understand that, but it ruins like how reincarnation works. It does not work if Grady and Jack were alive at the same time. You no, could no, say, no, unless no. you're saying unless you're saying that Danny's a sacrifice. Yeah. But at that point, no, it's not because Danny escapes and Jack dies and he's trapped in there. Yeah, but see, my point. What I'm saying is, is damn. Why, why would it matter if they're if they were both alive at the same time if they're two separate entities? Because they're saying that this person, the the innkeeper uh, or the housekeeper, is reincarnated and it's the same person going through the same hell over and over and over. Yeah, so like, the guy at the they... beginning tells him that in 1970, a previous caretaker, Charles Grady, went crazy and killed his family. Okay, then they can't so be it's the same. About ten years. That's apart. what I'm saying. They're two separate entities. 
No, no, th- no. That's that's the problem for reincarnation to work. If it's the same person going through the same hell over and over and over, killing his family then over Jack and over and over, would be going through his own hell over and over and over. Correct, again. And but that Grady means Grady would be going on through his own hell over and over and over again. But they were and alive they in the same other. world at the same time. And yeah, I can't, I can't get behind it. I, I'm not Jay understanding. It. I'm not understanding what you're saying. I'm not understanding because if it's the same soul I'm, that's being my reincarnated, point. that's what I mean when I say different entities, different souls, different so spirits, different people. Then it's not reincarnation. It's, it's just a Jack's new soul every time. Reincarnation and Grady's reincarnation. Jack is reincarnated. Grady is reincarnated. If it were me and you. I would be reincarnated, and you would be reincarnated. Not us so together, they're just switching? one person. They're not switching. I, they're different people. Yeah, I don't like that then, because I just feel like that's too many people. Like That means that the, the hotel is constantly like going, all right, it's this person's time, this time. Uh, the other guy, he's got to wait until he's reincarnated after this next guy to get in line. And he's got to wait 30 years. Yeah, but I never said there was a line or anything. I mean, there could be fucking 50 or 60 people going all through it at once. Could be different folks. Main yeah, main no, but that's what I'm two. saying. I mean, that's what I'm saying. That's why I don't like it. Like, if it was clean and Grady died, like, in the 1920s, and then th- and this is him being reincarnated as Jack coming through for this one, then I would like it. It's very clean. It's very fucking straight. It's a really good theory. But if it's multiple different people getting uh multiple different entities as you said uh getting reincarnated and having to go back to the hotel at different points i i don't i that becomes less clean and becomes too sloppy and feels a lot more uh feels as forced as a lot of the other theories for the movie i don't think so but i get what you're saying i just kind of i've got this own thing going on in my head about it about how that would work and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, I'll think about it. It just, it just doesn't track well with me. Um, like I still, yeah, I just can't. Jay, Jay ruined it for me. It's all Jay's fault. (laughs) (laughs) I always just assumed that each victim, the hotel claims then becomes a ghost and the whole party and each, each ghost is a bit essentially assigned a role when they get claimed by the hotel. So Grady was the caretaker. He went crazy. He became the the, the butler. The bartender is someone who probably went crazy at one point, was claimed by the hotel, and is now assigned the bartender role. And so Jack being in the picture is just saying that he's been but claimed by the hotel, and now been, he's been assigned a role hotel for the next This hotel has person. only been around for 50, 60 years. Yeah, because I'm not mistaken, they the said it was like 1907. Yeah, so at best, it, it's it been there for maybe 60 years, depending on when this movie's supposed to take place. Uh, I guess you could say 70, or since it takes place in uh, the 80s. I think it's supposed uh, but to take the, place in 77. Um, yeah, so if it takes place in 77, somewhere between 60 and 70 years, uh, the picture specifically states something in the 20s, which to me makes me think it didn't. Yeah, so it didn't open until 26 to me. Like, that's probably the, like, it was being built, it got furnished, and had its, like, kick-open party, uh, you know, for the new year on in 1926. So, I think that also plays against the reincarnation of multiple entities also, because it really hasn't been around long enough. I think, I think that more leans towards what Jay says, except it does not, it also doesn't have the time to claim as many people well, that are there. Well, this is another problem with Kubrick's style of storytelling for this movie where there's so much left open and unexplained because we don't know. What if what happened in, in that room is, you know, a bunch of people got killed and then who that guy who did it just, like, wiped out an entire hotel's worth of people? Because, uh, well, the only white people you would have there uh, besides Grady... I, I mean, there's probably random deaths that have happened there. They did talk about uh, specifically... Uh, them fighting off Native Americans while building it, so you could have the deaths of those white people being there. Actually, the um, lady that's in room two thirty seven is based off of a woman um, that uh, she would go and she would like lure young men in there, and she would have sex with them, and she couldn't take it anymore, so she killed herself in the bathtub. Where did you get that from? That's in the book. 
Oh, that's in the book. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, fair. I was because I was like, I didn't see that shit at all. Anyway, yeah, that's in the book. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, like I could see tiny. I could see certain characters being certain pieces. The the lady in the bathtub, the bartender, uh, Grady, but the rest of them, I, I are could be lost spirits or it could just be one one entity creating multiple of its own projections yeah. or something like that. Um, but I don't think that enough people have died to actually fill that ballroom, That's which fair. means that would cancel out what Jay said. And I don't think that there's been enough for anyone to start claiming reincarnation. Well, I think it just because there hasn't been enough. Second part of what I said, the first part where I feel like it's just him being claimed by the hotel like Grady was. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's perfectly good. It's just, uh, the second part of each one representing a claimed soul that doesn't work. And I also don't think the reincarnation works now uh, even more so because there hasn't been enough time for us to establish a reincarnation. Um, but fucking, but that's the thing about this movie. You can even focusing on what, like what's in the movie, you can come up with tons of theories and you can argue pro and cons of all the theories. And some of them will make sense to others while others won't. That's kind of the the fun thing. I think you could do a whole podcast just on having a roundtable discussion where each episode covers a different theory. Yeah. And you could probably make a good chunk of episodes just on that. Someone should do that. I will come on for the blowjob theory or my atheist theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kenneth will have to come on for reincarnation because I, I, I can't do that one. Um. But that's it. Yeah, you, you might have to video. send me that video. I'll send me the video because I want to see that. I'll, I'll, I'm pretty sure that I'm, I'm pretty video. sure that I'm leaving some shit out, and they explain you, yeah. it much better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do that. Send me the video, and maybe I'll I'll think uh, differently on it. Um, and if anyone wants the blowjob video, I'll send that. Um, there, it's on YouTube. I think. Yeah, I think the one on YouTube me. is a little bit shorter, but you can send that one to uh, me. Some kind of which way to link to it or whatever. Yeah, so, okay. Holy fuck, that was The Shining. Um, uh, I I feel like we did we, we spent more time on other stuff than actually reviewing the movie. Just but fine. to be honest, <laughs> do, do you need someone to review this movie anymore? I don't think so. Uh, I think it was much funner to just kind of have a discussion about the, the movie, the theories, what we can do with them, what we can't do with them. I feel like uh, these episodes are our best, to be honest with you. Yeah, a little bit of uh, arguing, fucking a uh, little bit of debate. I like it. It's fucking great. So, Jerry, I got a question for you. Yeah. How would you feel about the Paranormal Activity series? Ugh. I think I've only seen three of them. Uh, is the third one the one with the witches, the witch coven? No, that's the fourth one, I think. Okay, I think I've seen four of them then. I can't really remember. I, uh, I went and saw the one with the witch coven in theaters, and uh, there was this gay black boy in front of me who fucking uh, kept flipping out and screaming and asking for Jesus, and it was hilarious. <laughs> so that's probably the best movie in the series. Um, and I went back and I, I rewatched uh, after I went and saw that one, because I had uh, never seen a Paranormal Activity when I went and saw that movie. Um, I just went because I didn't really give a shit. So when I got home from that, I actually ended up watching at least the first two. Um I thought they were okay. I did watch them at night with the lights out while I was home alone to kind of get in the fear. Uh, it did creep me out. Um, I don't... I think... I, I wouldn't put them up as some of the best uh, found footage. I still think Hell, Hell, Hell House LLC wanted to destroy that one. I'll have to check those out. All the reason why I was asking is because it's what auto-played after... The Shining was finished on Hulu. Interesting. Um, I, I like the concept. Um, I don't really care for this whole like like thing they have where it's following the family. Um, I didn't really give a shit about that. Uh, I guess it is a way to keep the story going. But it's been so long. I haven't watched them. Last time I watched them uh, was... God damn. That was... It's, it's gotta be... <laughs> six or seven years at, at least since I've watched one of those movies. And I haven't seen any of the ones past the witch coven one with the two little girls 
were getting pulled by the hair and stuff. By the rapey ghost. He's very rapey. Always messing with them in their beds. Didn't he want to... Didn't, weren't they, like, trying to set up one of the girls to marry the ghost or some shit? I don't know. I didn't get that far. Um, uh, the main ones that I remember are the first three. Okay. Dave, Dave Z, you love Paranormal Activity. You know... Were they trying to have the the one in the the one where at the end of the movie they represent a witch coven or maybe it wasn't that one but it's the one with the two daughters, uh, young girls and like one of them gets pulled by hair. Were they trying to have one of them marry the ghost? Was the old ghost dude trying to fuck him? What was going on there, Dave Z? You know, and I know you listen, so let me know because I'm entirely uh, fucking confused. So, bitch. Yeah, okay, I guess with that, we are out. Um, we will be back in, like, two weeks. Uh, we are going to do a horror coliseum next. So, we're taking the two weeks so we can, you know, <laughs> properly do it. We will have um, some slight changes to the categories. Um, but we have a great uh, a great one coming up. The only hit you'll, hint that you get is Sam Neill. So... We will see you in about two weeks. What are we doing? This what, which one are we doing again? What, Jurassic I, I Park. Jurassic Jurassic Park and uh, Jurassic I don't know World. another Jurassic World. A uh, Jurassic Park versus Jurassic Park Three is what we're doing. <laughs> so you know, uh, so we will see y'all in about two weeks. Uh, so check out all the cool shit we've got a Facebook group uh, for you to chat in, and you can. Uh, Tell me about how uh, you heard that Nancy is a bad actress. Uh, you can join our Facebook page that you can like on Facebook to see whatever memes we have found that we thought were funny and horror related. We've got those posted. You can check uh, Kenneth out on Instagram, Silent Hill Biker 666. Um, Actually, I think you can check us 66. out. Is it just 66? Did I add another six? I think you did. Hang on. Oh, hell saying. Um, check us out on Twitter. You can check us out, uh, Kill the Cast shirts. Uh, hopefully, we'll have a new design coming soon uh, where you can join our fan club. That's uh, Mooses with Nooses. And we'll have a new Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space uh, shirt coming out soon. We just dropped an episode for that for Gorgo. So check that out because it was a whole lot of fun. And uh, I think that's it. Does anyone have anything they want to tell to the audience? Silent nope. Hill Biker 66. Yeah, no extra six. Mm, you missed an opportunity there, Kenneth. Two sixes. Actually, no, I did it on purpose. I didn't put the third one in there. Why? To fuck with me, or does 66 mean something? Neither uh, or. I used to put 666 at the end of things, but damn, I caught a lot Kinda of Kind of played out. Yeah, and, you know, I was just like, make something a little bit easier for people, and, you know, because there are people out there that have superstitions and shit, which, you know, I got a tattooed on my wrist, so I really don't give a shit, but there are people that are superstitious. It's always funny to me to get when it. you're in a store, and you want a person to, like, and the people want you to take a penny off, or, or fucking add a penny or whatever, so that their, their, uh, their purchase doesn't come out to, like, $6.66 or something. Right. Yeah, I will... I wanted to get 666 tattooed on my dick, but it wasn't long enough. Oh, start at your balls. Dude, 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 dude. Ouch. God, no, Jay. What kind of fucking sadist are you? I'm just trying to come up with practical solutions to your issue here. He's, Jay's into that kind of thing. Ugh. So, okay. Guys, we are out of here. Let us know in the group how you feel about The Shining, how you feel about the theories, how you feel about my theory. Uh, which one do you subscribe? Do you not subscribe to any of them? Are you like Kenneth where you just watch the fucking movie and that's all you give a shit about? Uh, tell us. We know this is a favorite movie for a lot of people and a lot of people were very interested in what we were going to say. So I hope we lived up to it. And um, uh, that's it, I guess. I don't fucking have anything else to say to y'all, y'all. So goodbye, good night, uh, kitty cats rule. Inception Bear. ended in the real world. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema Beef, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, 
Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Mental Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick 6 Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shade Cast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which Versus the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found.